So, good morning. So you are at the right place because here it's space. And uh, so this is the space part of the uh, ICT forum. So uh, a warm welcome to all of you, those who are present uh, today in uh, the room and those who are connected online. I must say that uh, the, the organizers, they are resilient. We, we shall speak a lot about resilience today, but uh, I would like to congratulate the, the organizers because they are resilient. Uh, they, they could succeed to organize this uh, forum every year, including last year, which was uh, mostly uh, online. And uh, today, this is uh, part of the recovery uh, plan. So I am Jean-Jacques Gordin and uh, I have spent 30 years at the European Space Agency uh, and now it, uh, I am involved since uh, in the last uh, six years in uh, several startups in Europe developing space products and, uh, and services. So it's two different approach of space. The one of an agency, uh, governmental ag ag agency, and the one uh, more uh, bottom-up. But these two approaches have the same objective, that this is the very important part. Uh, they are not in opposition. They are certainly in competition, and I like competition. But the, the objective is the same. There is no opposition in terms of objective because the objective is just to make of space an essential element of the daily life on planet Earth today and tomorrow even more, an essential element of the sustainability of humanity on planet Earth because the sustainability of, planet, of humanity is even more important than the sustainability of planet Earth because, frankly speaking, I am more concerned by the future of humanity than by the future of planet Earth. I am sure that planet Earth will survive humanity. So uh, let's focus on, uh, on humans and, uh, and humanity. So we shall, uh, we shall see that all along this morning, I shall be, I have been appointed master of ceremony, uh, meaning that I shall look at the clock. This is mostly my, uh, my role. But, uh, uh, this morning session, you will see that it's a very rich session. Uh, more or less 20 speakers coming from four different continents, meaning that some of them will be, uh, will be online, uh, but they will be uh, with us. And uh, there will be eight successive steps during this morning session. So this is eight steps to, to space. And uh, so enjoy this uh, morning session. The first speaker this morning is the Minister Fayot with the Minister of Economy of Luxembourg, a great supporter of space, as Luxembourg in general, uh, who will introduce this uh, fourth edition of the Space Forum. And I can tell you, having attended each of the editions of the Space Forum, the world has changed so much and so quickly since the very first uh, edition of the Space Forum that uh, we have more and more to say every year. So, Minister Fayot, I think that uh, it's your, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you at the Space Forum. Over the years, the Space Forum has become an essential annual meeting place for all the space players in Luxembourg and beyond. It is an opportunity for me to highlight some of the latest developments in the national space ecosystem, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to open this event. Ladies and gentlemen, since last year's edition, and despite the pandemic, I am pleased to say that the Luxembourg space ecosystem keeps growing. The Luxembourg space ecosystem has significantly grown in terms of companies. Where last year there were about 50 companies and research bodies listed in the space directory, there are now 70 which are active in Luxembourg. 
the steady growth of the space players, establishing their activities in Luxembourg, which has been witnessed over the past couple of years, is a sign of Luxembourg's attractiveness for the space sector. And it shows the positive impact of the efforts being driven by the Ministry of Economy and the Luxembourg Space Agency. Not only is the number of space industries growing, but the space capabilities represented in Luxembourg continue to thrive as well, helping to position Luxembourg on the international space stage and to keep its first mover position. Our ambition was also that the growth of the space sector would have a multiplier effect and the development of knowledge and skills in Luxembourg. The fact that a world-renowned company like Thales Alenia Space chose Luxembourg to create its digital center of excellence is proof that we are on the right track. Another example of a recently established space player is the German company URI, which is taking microgravity research to the next level. The facility to be developed in Luxembourg will be the first of its kind globally and will position Luxembourg as an even more important hub for a post-ISS world. Among the latest newcomers, let me also mention Flawless Photonics, who is pioneering the first profitable supply chain in space. They aim to produce photonic products in space, like optical fiber, for example, that will significantly outperform silica fibers. That would boost performance for every industry that currently uses optical fibers. This is a perfect illustration of the skill multiplier effect of our growing space ecosystem. Space technologies can further accelerate sustainable development. In this context, international research collaboration between institutional and industrial partners is a key element. The creation of ASRIC, European Space Resources Innovation Center, at the end of last year, in close collaboration with ESA, the Luxembourg Space Agency and the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, perfectly pursues this objective. ASRIC will partner with public and private players in the field of space resources in order to create a hub of excellence for space resources research in Europe. International cooperation and science is also one of the main topics of today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to attracting players to settle in Luxembourg, we have also focused on fostering talent. The talents and skills we develop are fundamental for the ongoing growth of commercial space companies. Those companies require experts who believe in the technology, but also who understand the underlying economics. That is why, three years ago, we have set up the Interdisciplinary Space Master in collaboration with the University of Luxembourg. This year, for the third promotion of the master's degree, the university accepted 28 candidates out of a total of 156 applications from all over Europe and beyond. This proves that the master program continues to be met with great interest and contributes to building up talents for the space industry. I am finally also happy to say that the Luxembourg Space Agency evolves in line with the growth of our space sector as it will now be set as an independent entity. This new status will further empower the agency to support and develop the national ecosystem in close collaboration with the Ministry of the Economy. Before I conclude, I would like to invite you to meet again in Dubai, where I will be traveling end of October, together with a business delegation for a first official visit of the Luxembourg Pavilion at the Expo Dubai 2020. I will lead an economic mission focused on space activities organized around the International Astronautical Congress, the IAC. This is the next important milestone for our ecosystem and the positioning of Luxembourg on the world stage. I am convinced about the huge opportunities that the space sector brings to our economies and to mankind in general. And I am committed to maintaining the strong momentum built up over the last four decades and to consolidate our position as a leading player in space. I wish you all an enjoyable conference and inspiring talks. I regret not being able to be with you in person, but I am delighted that the event is being held physically and I hope to meet you in person 
very soon. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I, uh, I uh, appreciate your commitment and the commitment of Luxembourg. I must say that uh, I was the Director General of ISA when I have signed the accession of Luxembourg uh, to, uh, as a, a member state of uh, ISA. And I, I must say that in less than 10 years, Luxembourg has become the biggest contributor to ISA relatively its GNP. Uh, meaning that Luxembourg is much bigger in space than on ground. And uh, I think that this is good news. And uh, as you have seen, uh, uh, this is uh, a very committed minister. And I like committed, committed minister. That it's, uh, this is the, the best that we can have in all countries. So now, next uh, step is an exchange among three friends. Uh, unfortunately, two of them could not uh, be uh, present, but they, they will be online. So uh, you, you see uh, in the middle uh, Valanathan Munzami, the uh, CEO of the Space Agency of South Africa. And uh, on your uh, right, Monsieur Vouji the former director general of the National Space Science Center in China, which is a member of the uh, Chinese Academy of uh, Science. And myself, I shall be a little bit more than just the master of ceremony. I shall be part of the exchange among the three of us. So, uh, first of all, I would like to check if uh, you, Valanathan, and uh, uh, Angie, you are online. Hi, good morning, Jean-Jacques. I'm actually online. Thank you. Okay, I can see that. Good Thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, Angie? good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm uh, also online. I can see you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are the three of us, and uh, we, uh, we are supposed to speak about the one planet approach in front of a pandemic, uh, which... Uh, is crossing since uh, now almost two years uh, all borders on uh, on planet Earth, and uh, this is certainly space. And uh, uh, Charlie Bolden, uh, Vuji, and myself, we have uh, translated that into uh, articles in newspapers. Uh, certainly, space has brought this one planet concept to humanity. And uh, starting, and I was, uh, I was born already at that time, starting in uh, 1968 with the Apollo 8 mission. Apollo 8 has been a breakthrough uh, in the history of humanity because uh, this is for the first time three men. Unfortunately, it was three men, but uh, uh, making a tour of the moon for the first time in the history. And I must say that I have always said that in many of my speeches that uh, this is certainly the most important heritage of the Apollo program. The fact that the US flag was the first on the moon is not relevant anymore in the current world. While the three astronauts making a turn around the moon and for the first time, looking at the Earth's rise coming from the uh, far side of the moon uh, is certainly the most important heritage of the Apollo program and still relevant today and even more relevant every day. Just let's quote uh, Bill Anders when he has seen this Earth's rise, he has said that the we have mm -hmm. made all this way to explore the moon, but the most important is that we have discovered planet Earth, which was for the first time one planet, one crew, human, the humans on board, planet Earth, and one future. And that is certainly the, uh, a breakthrough in our history. 
And since then, space has become the best laboratory of international cooperation for humanity. It's just a couple of years after, there was the Apollo-Soyuz mission in 1975, meaning that the two countries which were racing in the 60s, they managed to make a joint mission just a couple of years later, demonstrating that space could be a laboratory of cooperation between two nations which were uh, in, in war, even if the war was called. And then it was followed by the International Space Station in the 90s, which is the reunification of the Station of the West, Freedom, and the Station of the East, Mir. And the International Space Station is made today of five partners, United States, Russia, Japan, Canada, Europe. But it's more than that. It's a crew of six persons uh, living and working together in space. And to make these six persons living and working in space, there are thousands of persons on ground to make their stay <clears throat> safe and useful. And, and that demonstrates that cooperation is based on persons. It's much more than just nations cooperating or agencies cooperating. It's people cooperating. I remember when Mike Griffin left NASA after having been an administrator, I made a speech uh, that Griffin still remember, saying that it's difficult to cooperate with NASA because between NASA and NASA, there were ups and downs. But it is so easy to cooperate with Mike Griffin meaning that the, the relationship between persons is more important than the relationship between agencies or, uh, uh, or uh, nations. And I would like to, to finish my introduction by a few quotes which are interesting. Mike Griffin has declared that space station is very important because the partnership will stay much longer than the hardware. The hardware will come to an end, but the partnership will stay. So that it's Mike Griffin. But I have read that recently Monsieur Ragozin from Russia said that the ISS is a family where divorce is not possible. That is also an important quote. And myself, mm. I dare to to repeat, even if my wife does not like that, that mutual interest is much more sustainable than love. You, you have not to love your partner. You have just to have mutual interest. And this is a way we can cooperate. But there are still so much to do, so much to do to extend the international cooperation, to make of humans only one crew on planet Earth. And I would like to recall that in a crew, there is no spectator. All the crew members are actors, meaning that all humans must be actors of their future, not spectators. And the second lesson coming from, from the ISS is that the, the astronauts, they are spending 50% of their time just to take care of the spacecraft. If we were all dedicating 50% of our time just to take care of our spacecraft, planet Earth, that would be a fantastic change. So this is all the lessons learned that we can draw from the experience of space. So it's, it's not theory. This is practice. And we have to practice international cooperation. So this is what I wanted to say at start. But now I have spoken enough, so I would like to, maybe since, uh, G, you are on the screen, uh, I, give you, I give you the floor to uh, give your views about uh, planet Earth and the crew of planet Earth. Okay, thanks, uh, Jean-Jacques. Uh, it's uh, my uh, 
great pleasure to join this uh, conference again. Uh, due to the COVID-19, I cannot be on site with you. Uh, however, I have uh, been uh, keep contacting with uh, with uh, my colleagues in Europe and in America uh, all the time. Uh, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Shanshak has mentioned that uh, um, it is important to have international collaboration and space is the best laboratory for us to collaborate because uh, space, there's a, when you go to space, there's a no bounder, uh, there's no, no, uh, uh, you cannot distinguish uh, uh, where is China, where is US, where is U Europe, it uh, belongs to all the human beings. And uh, last year, at the beginning, first half of last year, when we had uh, the heaviest uh, attack from COVID-19, we all realized that uh, this virus are attacking, uh, was attacking uh, the human beings without any selection without uh, distinguishing whether you are European or you are American or you are Chinese. They are attacking, attacking uh, the human beings uh, without any distinction. So uh, with the attack from an outsider, from outside enemy, we realize that uh, the human beings is one family. It's like in the space. So that's why we uh, talked uh, between us and then we write articles uh, about this. I can share the screen and you can see that uh, uh, we have, uh, can we, can, can we, can I share the screen? No, it uh, seems impossible. But uh, anyway, we have published uh, our papers on nature and also on other English newspapers French newspapers and Chinese newspapers uh, talking about this international collaboration or space uh, is is a one way to uh, get uh, human beings all together, and in that way we can uh, against uh, any enemy from outside of the earth or, or from any virus. So this is a uh, uh, make us realize that the space is really something make the human beings uh, realize we are one uh, race, we are one, uh, we are the only uh, uh, species in the solar system that, uh, that uh, we, we are the only one, we are the only uh, uh, intelligent species. So we have to work together. Like uh, Shangshak has mentioned in the late 60s, uh, the human has the possibility to look at the Earth from far, from uh, the geostationary orbit or even from the moon. When you look back our Earth from that distance, the Earth turned out to us is, is a one planet. It's beautiful. It's beautiful planet. And from there, you don't see any boundary. You don't hear any noise. Uh, you, you don't uh, uh, see any... Uh, uh, color of the skins and uh, the human beings turn out to be a one unit species. So we think space is really something that uh, reflect the new mind uh, in the 20th century. Now we are in the 21st century. So it's, it's only less than 70 years when we come into the space. So this mentality should uh, continue, should uh, drive us to, uh, to collaborate to each other. And uh, it's not like uh, in, the, in the big discovery in the five, 400 years ago, when, we, when you have a ship, you discover the, the, the new uh, land and uh, discover the Americans and the nations are fighting each other and to, uh, to uh, grab the resources uh, from the other countries. And now we are turned into a new uh, century, so which is a, a space, gave us the information, gave us the, uh, the, the information that uh, we are, the human beings should uh, work together, should taking care of the, of the earth, 
all together, and uh, we will have a view of outward view, and not uh, just inward to see your own country or to see your your own uh, uh, nationalities. So space can save us in that way. So I fully agree uh, with Shang Shak Dodan that we should collaborate and we should uh, all work for space, for the future of space, uh, not even uh, governmental space, but also commercial space and to make the human beings go into the space as soon as possible, as many as possible, like the space tourism. So that uh, concludes uh, my point. Uh, G, uh, I would like to, to, to mention that the article that you were referring to, uh, because during the COVID, uh, uh, we had some time to, uh, uh, to work on uh, different matters. And uh, yes, there was an article written by uh, Charlie Bolden, uh, the uh, former NASA administrator, Wu uh, Ji uh, from the Chinese Academy of Science, and, and myself, we have written an article speaking of the lessons uh, from space. Just to say that this article has been published by the Space Forum. So uh, this is available uh, and in three languages, uh, French, English, and, uh, and Chinese. And uh, I am glad that we could, we could write that uh, uh, from uh, uh, someone from United States, someone from China, and someone from, from Europe. Uh, and uh, now, Valanatan. Uh, I would like to, to give you the floor, to give the, uh, your view, your personal view, but also your, the, the view of Africa for this uh, uh, question of international cooperation. Thanks, Jean Jacques, and uh, thanks to Wuji as well. Uh, just to start off by saying that I resonate with the messages that you just um, set out just now. Um, first of all, from uh, what Wuji has said, um, if you look at the Earthrise picture um, and you look back, there are no boundaries. There no, there's no national boundaries. And so what we see and what we experience on Earth is more an artifact of what we as humans have put down. Uh, so those boundaries that we have created is our own artifact. But sometimes the narrative that we we send out is is mixed in a way, because when we talk about Earth, we talk about sustainability. But when we act, we act as single countries or sovereign states, essentially. And if you look at the COVID pandemic that we are facing now, it's purely because we have um, sort of competing agendas. And there's a level of mistrust that's creating when you look at the geopolitical agendas that's on the table at the moment. And if you look right now in terms of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a couple of things that stands out is that countries have responded to the pandemic from a national security point of view. So each country is seeing um, and responding to COVID-19 more from the national perspective. So the question you need to ask is where's the multilateral platform that should have been pulling all of us together and acting in concert? The second thing is that when you look at even the rollout of vaccines, and I'm hoping that everybody is being vaccinated as we speak, um, there's an inequity that's been created because there's some countries that are still lagging behind in terms of supply or uh, actually getting access to the supply of vaccines. So we live in a world that's highly inequitable. And some of the issues that you've raised around how space actually pulls us together, because if you look at the Outer Space Treaty, it's a province of all mankind. It does not belong to any particular nation state. And so when we get into space, there's a willingness to work and share ideas. But if I bring that particular My apologies. Uh, issue back, I hear what you sorry, said. if we bring back the issue, um, you know, the policy framing back to Earth, there are three key issues that every government is responsible for. One is ensuring the quality of life of its citizens. The second is ensuring economic growth. And the third is to balance that against the sustainability issue. And so when we're framing it, we're looking at it from people, prosperity, and planet. But what normally tends to happen in the way we act is that the prosperity seems to be the forerunner. It, it's it's the, the economic growth that seems to drive how we act and behave. And then the people and the planet seems to come 
uh, mm -hmm. as a latter uh, factor. And what we should actually be looking at is the planet, putting the planet first and seeing how people and prosperity then come in that order. And so the, how we framing the narrative and how we having this conversation is, is very, very key. And what's also important when we're trying to balance the quality of life with the uh, economic growth and sustainability of uh, our planet Earth is to understand there's many competing factors when you're trying to do, you know, under, understanding this balancing act. You have various actors, you have various disciplines that you have to take care of, uh, you have to look at mutual benefits. Uh, when you're framing policy instruments, what are the equilibrium points? What is the policy focus? And all of this requires good governance. And you'll see in many countries around the world, especially in Africa, governance is something that's uh, very weak. You find there are many states that have weakened uh, governance structures. And that's creating a huge problem in terms of uh, shaping the policy space in terms of how we act and behave. There's a third element. When you're looking at it from how government, industry, and society comes together, and you can look at it from different perspectives, From let's say from an economic growth. If you look at it from an economics point of view, uh, what is the role of government against, against the households? Um, and if you're looking at it from, a let's say, a social perspective, what is the social compact that pulls all of us together? Are we in agreement? And so where I'm getting with this conversation is that we need to look at it more from a values perspective. Um, because if you look at how we behave here on Earth, it's almost like we play the zero-sum game. So there's one winner and that's one loser. But when you start to look at it from a different perspective, what we call a multi-sum game, where everybody stands to win or everybody stands to lose. And I think this is the, the key philosophy, for example, in the International Space Station and certain space missions where many countries are working together. It's a multi-sum game. Everybody wins. And if we don't work together, everybody loses. And that's how need to approach even how we deal with our planet Earth, uh, the one planet perspective. And we need to maybe look at the, uh, the, how we ground the philosophy in terms of how we think, because what we tend to do is to drive, look at it from a missions-driven perspective, and then see what sort of values that's needed to pull through the mission. I'm actually advocating because, as Jean Jacques had indicated, it's the personal relationship, it's the people that matter. And so what we should be looking at is values-driven, mission-led. It's not mission-driven, values-led. It's values-driven, mission-led. Because we are talking about people acting in concert and coming together. And so I want to advocate quite strongly, and we're seeing that happening in, in outer space, in the various missions and so on, is to advocate for a set of values, you know, respect, excellence in terms of quality and performance, responsibility, being accountable, being commit committed. And then also teamwork, collaboration and cooperation, innovation, creativity and ingenuity. Uh, that's forming the crust around the innovation aspect. And then also achievement. What are the results? What are the successes we're looking for? Fairness, diversity, inclusiveness. And if you think and if you apply your mind, this is actually happening in outer space at the moment. If you take what's uh, how the International Space Station, the collaboration that's happening around there. But we want to see more collaboration in that respect. So. As I started off by saying, the Outer Space Treaty says that the outer space is the province of all humankind. There's no sovereignty that exists in outer space. Uh, but yet we've created those artificial boundaries here on Earth. There's only one home that we have that we call planet Earth. So let's take care of it and work together. So the values-driven uh, approach is what I would advocate for very strongly. Thanks, Jean-Jacques and Uji. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Valenatan. And uh, thank you for your words. And I take, uh, I, I keep the fact that uh, we have to, uh, uh, we have only to have winners. I think that uh, there, 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 this is not a game where there is winners and losers. It's, uh, it's just, we have to, to create the momentum to have only winners. I would not like, and because I, I see that time is running and uh, we could spend hours on that uh, uh, discussion, but I, I would like maybe to take one point because I would not like to, to, to give the impression that cooperation excludes competition. Mm. On the contrary, on the contrary, I think that cooperation needs competition. Uh, these two words are not uh, exclusive because uh, cooperation is a cooperation of interest 
why we need to have a competition of ideas. The solutions, the best solutions will come out from competition. Meaning that uh, we, we have to organize that competition, provided that the competition is made towards common interest and common objectives. And, and by the way, this is what I have experienced at ESA. There was a cooperation between the member states, but a competition between their industry. And, and the competition was always much better than no competition, because competition brings the best ideas. And, uh, and this is where I would like to, uh, to, to have your view on that, because uh, I hear a lot about competition between, uh, between Europe and China, between uh, different countries. So it, I have no problem with competition, provided that this competition is driven by common interest. So can you, can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, I fully agree with you that uh, we need uh, competitions, uh, but uh, this is, should be guided uh, under the umbrella of cooperation. So, uh, <clears throat> but the current situation is, uh, is still not uh, very idealized. So we have to, uh, my point is to have, uh, to, to get the message from the space uh, to benefit as many people as possible. What you mentioned, uh, the Earth Rise picture from 1968, it was uh, indirect information. So if people can go to the space and uh, personally with your naked eyes to look at the Earth from there, uh, you will get the message more directly. So I support very much, uh, a little bit uh, 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 beyond your topic, I very much support the Luxembourg uh, action to do a space resources because when you send more people go there, you need resources and those resources should not be bring uh, or bring them uh, all from uh, the earth. It's too heavy, too, uh, too cost. So if you can uh, use the in-situ resources on the moon and in the uh, asteroid, so it, it is a much more uh, economic uh, way. So I fully support the Luxembourg action to, for space resources. And in order to get more uh, people into space and to get uh, the information from the message from space directly, personally, so this is the right way to do. Of course, during the course, uh, you need a uh, uh, best solution, best uh, plans, and those uh, should come from competitions, not, uh, not uh, from one country, should uh, come from different countries and we get the best solution. So that's my point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Xi and Valanathan. Can you comment on that? Yes, John Jobs, I, I fully agree. Um, so it, we, we need co collaboration, we need competition, but there's a third element is uh, complementarity as well. So there's this word called cooperation, which is competition and collaboration or cooperation, essentially. And so we, we need to find a medium in terms of involving both. So if you look at it from an economics perspective, we seem to, we, we talk about divisions of labor. So for example, no single country can do every single activity to the best of its ability. So you have to divide in terms of which countries have a core competency. And then you complement in terms of how all of these things come together. And this is essentially what we talk about, even, you know, at a national level or regional level, we talk about systems of innovation. And the idea is not so much these uh, centers of excellence that we've created in terms of institutions, but how they link up together. So in the nodes themselves, you might have uh, a lot of research and development that's being done in terms of pushing ideas into the commercial domain, as an example. But the actual linkages in terms of how that system comes together, collaboration space is also key. So I, I fully agree. We need to have a, a balance between the uh, cooperation, the competition, but also finding a way of complementing how all of that comes together. And that's essentially where the innovation comes in. When you start to stack different ideas, different uh, multidisciplines together, and you come up with new ideas, and that's the essence of uh, discrimination in many instances. 
So thanks, Jean, uh, Jean Jacques. I fully agree. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Unfortunately, uh, again, we are now very close to, to the end of this uh, first uh, uh, first topic. Uh, I would like to, to thank you very much. Just uh, to, to take your point, uh, uh, G, uh, we, we shall speak of space resources uh, later in the, in the morning. So uh, we, we are not forgetting that uh, very important uh, uh, aspect. I would like maybe to... To, to conclude this session by, by, by speaking of resources, because the only natural resources which are increasing every day on planet Earth, this is the brains of the humans. Because when I was at school, I, we were 2.5 billion of inhabitants. The, the number of humans have been multiplied by a factor of three just during my lifetime. Uh, meaning that Yes, it's maybe a problem to have too many humans, but it's also a solution because the brains of the humans are the best way to provide the best solutions. And this is where the competition is very important because all these brains provided they are educated. And obviously, we shall speak also of education during, uh, during this morning session, but provided all these brains are properly educated, they can provide the solution that we are looking for to sustain humanity on planet Earth. So uh, we should work a lot on education uh, all together also. So thank you very much. Uh, G and Valatan, Valanatan, I, I hope that I shall meet you uh, soon in person. I don't know where, but wherever we, we can. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I shall pass to the next session, uh, which is uh, uh, a fireside side chat on the NASA Artemis program. So there also it's a question of uh, cooperation and competition. Uh, this is the next step after the International Space Station. So uh, the floor is yours and also to our colleague from NASA. Thank you. Sam, you're with us. Good morning. Yes, good morning. You're good, either up very, very late or, or very early, one or the other. Um, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, my name, my name is Paul Schonenberg. I'm an American from New York. I've been in Luxembourg for 30 years. I've had... Um, 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 multiple careers across multiple domains, and for the past 23 years, among the things I've done is it's been my pleasure to be the chairman and CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you a little bit about, um, about space. Uh, two years ago, um, the United States was um, very kind and very generous um, to Luxembourg by inviting Luxembourg to go ahead and join the Artemis, uh, Artemis Initiative. And I think this is something incredibly important for Luxembourg in both the short and the long term, but I also don't think that quite many people fully understand what this is all about and what the opportunity is uh, for Luxembourg. So I'm pleased to be with Sam Cimini from um, Senior Advisor at, um, at NATO to be going ahead and talking about that uh, a little That's bit this morning. That, uh, that, excuse me, Paul, that's NASA. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me, NASA. I'm sorry. Um, Sam, let's start out by quick giving you just a moment to, um, just a moment to introduce yourself so that uh, our guests know who you are. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, again, my name is Sam Shimini. Um, I am uh, work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, I work in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. And I'm responsible, uh, one of the persons who are responsible for uh, getting us to the moon and on to Mars and the Artemis program and the um, moon to Mars campaign. Uh, my particular responsibility is to uh, uh, discuss uh, possibilities with uh, many international partners on how other countries can participate in with the Artemis program. Thank you. Moving on from that, if you can tell us a little bit more about the Artemis Initiative, its scope, how big is the project, what will it involve in terms of costs, 
And how long is it intended to last? Uh, well, let me answer the, the, the last question first. This is going to be a multi-decadal activity. Um, NASA is going to the moon to, to go there sustainably. Uh, first, it's a very large effort to get the first woman and the first person of color to the moon itself. Uh, it's a very uh, big effort that we have multiple companies uh, and we have international partnerships uh, to take us to the moon. Uh, one of the big efforts to go to the moon is to uh, develop the technologies, the, the abilities, and to test uh, all the systems necessary, uh, not just to go to the moon, but then to use that to go to Mars. So that's one of the big efforts. The second effort is to actually explore the moon uh, from a scientific standpoint. Are there resources there that are uh, available to us to uh, not only help us get get to live sustainably on the moon, but are there resources there to get us to Mars? Also is to understand, is there any viable commercial activities uh, that that are, are present on the moon? And and last but not least is, is that we want to be able to do all this with international and commercial partners. As far as cost, uh, like many many things in human space flight, this will be a multi-billion dollar effort over, over many decades, uh, not only uh, the expenses spent in the United States, but all over the world. Do you want to say a little bit more about the economic development of, of space as well? So the uh, what we're doing uh, on the commercial side is that we have commercial partners where we're buying services. Uh, we started this in low Earth orbit uh, with space station and commercial cargo, commercial crew. We're also experimenting on station uh, to see if there are any viable commercial activities like manufacturing or tourism uh, or other commercial activities. We want to expand that uh, to the moon as well as far as purchasing services. As far as uh, are there any economically viable commercial activities on the lunar surface, we don't know that yet. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we're going, especially with the CLIPS um, uh, program we have within Artemis is that we'll be prospecting to see if uh, there are any uh, volatiles or any other resources on the lunar surface that could be used in a in a in a uh, commercial commercial economy. You know, our title says that um, um, this is going to the moon, but it's also going to Mars. But as a first step, I also understood that the Artemis project is about putting the first woman on the moon. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so uh, most people are probably familiar with the Apollo program back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, you know, it was all, all the astronauts we had at the time were, were, were all male. So uh, th uh, this time we're going back to the moon and we're going back to the moon to ref have a more reflective uh, 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 personnel of, of our entire society. So I think that's very exciting um, to, to send the first one. Uh, woman and the first person of color to the moon. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one of the uh, initial things that uh, NASA uh, uh, described the Artemis mission as that's one of our major goals. In addition to the United States, and the uh, United States has invited Luxembourg to join, which other countries are participating in the initiative and what role will the different countries have? Well, so that's a, that's a big question. So, uh, Currently, uh, we have several partners right now uh, that uh, we are building uh, our, our SLS and Orion and uh, the gateway that's to be the orbital platform around the moon. So today um, we have we have ESA, we have Canada and we have uh, Japan uh, participating in what we're building right now. Um, we're in discussions with mul with many, many countries around the world, both in Europe and Asia and in the Middle East that uh, uh, could possibly uh, uh, participate in collaborative activities with us in the Artemis program. And th the capabilities, gosh, spanned all the way from uh, habitats to robotic arms, uh, rovers, landers, communication, uh, power generation, everything that, 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 that there is related to, to human spaceflight and getting humans out of low Earth orbit and on to, to the moon and Mars. You know, it, um, it really is an honor for Luxembourg to be included in this project. Can you give us some insight on why Luxembourg was included, what, what the vision is of the contributions that Luxembourg can make, 
and maybe a little bit even tell us about what benefits Luxembourg can derive from being involved in this partnership. Well, Luxembourg has, has expressed uh, uh, interest over uh, several years now on um, uh, lunar uh, prospecting for resources uh, and the utilization of those resources. Also, um, Luxembourg has a, a very active space uh, 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 community with over, uh, I believe, over well over 20 companies related to space. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, NASA's goals and Luxembourg's goals uh, has ha have a big intersection in the development of the technology and the ability uh, to uh, do the prospecting and do the resource utilization. That's one of the primary elements. There are others, as we can get into talk about later. Okay. Uh, just as an aside, I've noticed that um, uh, my friend, the Czech ambassador, is with us today in the audience, and he's brought one of his uh, Czech space companies with him today to go ahead and hear all of these presentations. If um, the Czech Republic, for example, is interested in, in joining this initiative, um, can I assume that this is an open process and that the U.S. is, is open and receptive to uh, having a, a broader, inclusive group participating in the project? Yes, that's definitely the case. Uh, we've had uh, several companies, uh, excuse me, several uh, countries that have uh, approached us and to uh, explore the possibilities of collaboration. So we're open to any countries that want to want to come and talk with us. Um, and we would uh, certainly welcome uh, the Czech Republic uh, uh, into these endeavors. Up to this point, you know, Luxembourg is still developing its um, its ecosystem and you know, one of the strengths of Luxembourg is a location to go ahead and do this, aside from the perception that Luxembourg is a politically neutral country, is the fact that Luxembourg has put a good legal system in place for the management of space. And that has attracted a number of international companies to go ahead and come to Luxembourg and set themselves up operating in the Luxembourg um, space ecosystem. But are there already Luxembourg companies either domestically or resident in Luxembourg that are in any way um, involved in the early stages or foreseen to be involved in the Artemis program? Well, um, being, being a government employee, I would not like to, to call out in, uh, individual companies. However, uh, I do know that uh, through, through the Luxembourg Space Agency is that uh, many companies are, uh, are proposing activities um, uh, that are related to Artemis, things like, uh, like I said before, the research, uh, um, resources, uh, prospecting and utilization, but also in, in the realm of robotic arms and rovers, uh, in space manufacturing, um, and solar power generation and, and even, uh, remote sensing. So, um, uh, it spans quite a few of the companies there in Luxembourg, uh, and, uh, um, we're very excited to uh, to uh, be work to be working uh, across the board, not only with the government but with uh, industry partners as well. Since the U.S. is and its partners are planning that this will be um, uh, a multi-billion uh, dollar initiative over many decades, um, are there um, are there can you give us some idea of what might be possibilities? Uh, for companies to uh, participate as uh, and 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 to be paid to go ahead and participate in in the, the project. What are the costs? What are the benefits? What are potential areas of opportunity for Luxembourg and Luxembourg-based companies to be associated with the initiatives? Well, I think uh, just like on Earth, where private companies provide power services, uh, they provide data for, uh, and from remote locations. Um, they provide uh, other, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, provide other services like the prospecting or, or uh, doing exploration as far as, as uh, gathering samples and bringing them back to Earth. All those can be viable uh, commercial activities where the gov where governments uh, pay for that information or pay for that services. Okay. Um, is, do you, are you aware of who the... Luxembourg point of contact um, happens to be that we have a number of people here who are representing private companies and uh, they may not necessarily know who their counterparties are to deal with. 
If there are companies here who are interested in um, engaging with NASA or engaging with uh, through the Luxembourg government uh, in this, can you give us some idea of, from a point of contact standpoint, who might be the appropriate point of contacts to approach in either a Luxembourg government entity or is, it, is, is there an open possibility for them to directly uh, engage with uh, NASA itself? Well, for, uh, for locally there in Luxembourg, certainly contact the Luxembourg Space Agency. Uh, uh, one uh, person of contact um, uh, uh, is Joseph Morcel, um, and uh, uh, he would probably be able to uh, point the companies in the right direction. Uh, also, uh, NASA engages with industry through uh, things like uh, requests for information and requests for proposals. Uh, those typically need to be a U.S. Uh, uh, a based company. Uh, uh, many, I know uh, some of the companies that are in Luxembourg are also in the United States as well. Um, so uh, I think the, at least the space companies in the United States uh, pretty much know how to uh, interact with NASA in our, uh, in our contracting activities. But local companies in Luxembourg could also function as suppliers to U.S. companies that are participating that, in the program as well. And, 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 that, and that's correct. There's also private industry to private industry. Uh, uh, that is also possible. Uh, and uh, I know there's uh, many U.S. companies also do business with uh, European companies across the continent. Okay. Um, Jean-Jacques, when he was making his presentation, was also talking about this is an effort for exploration. This is an, expert, uh, an effort to uh, grow knowledge. We talked a little bit about the beginning um, that this has some commercial aspects, but could you um, explore a little bit more some of the technological challenges that you think are to be faced um, in the development of this uh, long-term initiative? And do you have some idea of the categories of knowledge that um, uh, I'm sure in order to make this work, we're going to have to use technologies, technologies that don't even presently exist now. So could you give us some idea of maybe the, the steps in terms of developing of technology that um, may take place going forward, moving in the direction where we want to go? Yeah, certainly. Um, one of the challenges uh, that uh, we face on the lunar surface is actually the lunar surface itself. Uh, the lunar regolith, the lunar dust uh, is very corrosive. Um, it is also carcinogenic. Uh, that, uh, Unlike on Earth, where erosion has eroded uh, all the, the, the uh, eroded the surface on the Moon, uh, the the regolith is is more akin to broken glass, and uh, to get that on your skin or to breathe it in your lungs um, uh, when you come inside from doing an EVA, uh, those are all technology challenges to make sure that we uh, the humans do not really interact with the regolith. It also uh, plays havoc on 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 mechanical uh, systems, on uh, anything that's rotating or has to move uh, or seals. Uh, this this regolith uh, also will damage uh, any type of machinery like that or or or, or seals and things of that nature. Um, also, another big area is um, power generation uh, and uh, surviving the lunar night. Um, you, you might think that you know that. Uh, uh, that the, the uh, moon is constantly lit. Well, uh, it is not constantly lit, uh, and there are periods of darkness for, depending on where you are on the moon, you know, for a week at a time or days at a time. And surviving the night, the lunar night, is also a challenge on on how do you generate heat to keep your systems al uh, alive, whether it be through uh, uh, battery technology or or, or uh, solar, uh, excuse me, uh, power generation cells, uh, or, or even nuclear power, uh, that's also another big challenge. So there's several challenges like that uh, that are critical to uh, staying on the, on the moon for a long period of time. Hmm. Um, the International Space Station is um, lauded and appreciated for the fact that it has a multinational crew uh, of people that uh, are involved in it. Is it likewise envisioned with the Artemis program that this will be um, a multinationality um, effort uh, in terms of um, 
of the people who will be uh, participating in it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we expect through our collaborative activities uh, to also have an interna international cruise uh, 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 at the lunar surface as well, and in and around the moon also at Gateway as well. So yes, we certainly expect that through our collaborative activities with various nations. Um, we, uh, that's also another goal for, for NASA is to do this internationally, not just in partnerships, but also, also with crews. I know that the U.S. sometimes is its approach for doing things, thinks big and goes ahead and reaches on out with um, maybe even farther than it thinks that it can, than it can, can grasp and uses that as a motivator to get there. Is that partially what we're doing with the Artemis program too? That uh, in order to advance science, in order to in advance our understanding, um, we're taking um, uh, a broad brush and a and a, uh, and a big leap. Uh, is is that kind of the way this is being put together? If I've got it wrong, correct me. But I'm just wondering <laughs> no, what the it, approach is. No, this certainly is a big leap. Um, you know, we've been in, in low Earth orbit. Uh, for a very long time with our international partners. Uh, and it's t now time for us to now to go take the next big leap uh, uh, away from, from the Earth, away from low Earth orbit, and go to the next destination. The next uh, nearest destination was obviously the moon. And again, this next big leap is to prepare us for the next gigantic leap uh, to Mars. Uh, so if you think the, think the moon is hard, uh, Mars is even going to be harder than that. So this is this is not only to uh, 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 gain the knowledge, uh, but also gain the capability and expertise to operate in deep space on another uh, celestial body uh, that will uh, enable us to, to to know what we have to do to go to Mars. So yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big leap, cool. definitely. So to sum this up, we're talking about a multinational effort, a multidisciplinary effort that will advance and grow. Um, scientific discovery and um, take us to a new place, but take us together. Is that kind of it? Or will, will you give us a 30 second wrap up? I see on my sign, we still have. No. <laughs> Paul, well, I, I think you, 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 you pretty much uh, hit it. Uh, this is a meant to, to bring humanity uh, together uh, here on earth. And it, it's, you know, it all comes back to us here on earth, actually, you know, what we learned, uh, what we've been learning on space station, what we'll learn at the moon and going to Mars actually is all back applicable to us here on Earth. Uh, uh, how do we live together in, in a sustainable way? Uh, how, how do we uh, 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 are able to take care of our Earth here, knowing uh, the, you know the history of the moon and knowing the history of Mars? Uh, we have we have a fragile place that we that we live on, and uh, it's important for us to uh, gain this knowledge and to bring humanity together in this uh, uh, endeavor of exploration. Sam, thank you very much. We hope to see you all soon. Jean Jacques, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very very much, and I think that uh, that was. Uh, uh, interesting because it was in the continuation of our first uh, discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Now it's time to move to the next uh, speaker, and the next speaker is uh, is online. According to what I know, it's uh, Rui Pinto, who is the chief technology officer of SES. I must say that uh, I have worked for uh, some time with uh, Rui and uh, when he was uh, in the uh, UK, uh, but uh, now he's uh, uh, at SES in, uh, in uh, Luxembourg, so, uh, and he will speak about uh, uh, new space and uh, new ground. So Rui, do you hear us? Hello? Uh, yes, I hear you, Jean-Jacques. Ah, okay, I see you. So, and even I recognize you. So, uh, yeah. okay, Real nice to, to meet you again. <laughs> nice to have you uh, with us, and uh, and thank you for uh, sharing your uh, your views on uh, on the new challenge in front of us. Thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. Really appreciate it. And first. Uh, Thanks for giving 
me and SCS the opportunity to keynote uh, ICT Spring in Europe with a, with a great theme, developing new space and new ground, sustainable and scalable innovation enabling opportunities, not only for the industry, but for all of us. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And, and I apologize that uh, I could not be uh, there in person. We all miss uh, that face-to-face -face contact. Uh, the world has changed around us and it will get better, I believe, but it will never be exactly like it was before. Uh, uh, it's quite topical because I, I'm actually uh, in Cannes where uh, we are getting ready to ship our latest satellite, but more on that uh, a little bit later. So there is a lot to talk about on new space new day, uh, these days. And, and new space people, we tend to concentrate on the satellites, the things that fly, that we launch. But when you are in this industry, you quickly recognize that it's not just about space, right? It's about what we deliver. It's about what we have on the ground. So we are coining you know, that there is not only new space, but there is new ground as well. And it's an exciting industry to be. Uh, any industry that attracts the attention and capital of Silicon Valley titans, the likes of Amazon and others, is bound to be exciting and it's bound to be disrupted and it's bound to have opportunities. And I think SES and Luxembourg are in the right place today. There are plenty of opportunities and we are well placed to capitalize on those pioneering technologies opportunities that are ahead of us. And, and starting on the topics that I'm going to cover, the examples abound. If you look at the pandemic that impacts all of us, satellite connectivity has been key in enabling mobile laboratories to connect, to provide immediate connectivity in different places. Disaster response, you know, it's even more challenging nowadays when you have restricted movement and you have a health uh, scare on, on top of a disaster. And SES and Luxembourg, again, have been at the forefront. We, pro we deployed immediate help in Haiti in the recent disaster as another example. And, and sometimes we shouldn't think that disaster is something that happens to others or in some faraway place. Even back home uh, in Europe, you know, we had the floods that impacted Germany, Belgium, uh, and, and other countries. And emergency.lu, the joint initiative that we have with the Dutch government, was used to deploy quick communications where it was needed, uh, where it could make a difference to people that are impacted. And quite frankly, they are impacted next door. This is not something theoretical that happens on the other side of the world. We helped, for example, reconnect the St. Antonio's Hospital in the hard hit area of Axweiler in Germany. That's, that's a concrete example. And, and that should spur us on to continue on investing in space, new space and new ground, like I'm calling it. And a theme that I will return to is that Luxembourg is at the heart of that. And it's not just about the digital divide or connectivity or connecting the unconnected uh, in Africa, Europe and other places. It's also about developing new technologies, opening new opportunities, be it in uh, space resources like Jean-Jacques uh, alluded to at the start of the event, but also in quantum key distribution from space in the so-called Lux QCI, Project Quantum Computing Initiative, uh, which has a space component. It, it's, it's really, uh, I, I'm really proud that SES can play its part with Luxembourg and Europe on, on, on making sure new space is real space, that it makes an impact on uh, what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. So with that uh, little bit of 
long intro. Let, let, let me be a little bit more specific on space and on ground, right? Uh, in, in terms of space, the pace of innovation has been increasing. It's a challenge, but it's an opportunity for all of us. SES, and the reason I'm unfortunately not in Kirchberg this week, uh, SES is now getting ready with our partners, Thales, uh, to ship our latest generation uh, digital satellite, SES-17. It, it will be on a, on a plane to uh, uh, Kourou in French Guiana uh, by next weekend. And the SCS-17 packs a raft of new technologies in terms of digital processing, in terms of power that will allow us uh, uh, over the Americas to provide services for, again, connecting the unconnected in Latin America. I was surprised when we, were, we had the press event myself and the, the statistics that I saw that countries in Latin America, 75% of the population is connected. A whole 25% of the population has very limited, if any, access to internet connectivity at all. You compare that with the United States, the percentage is 95%. This is real. This makes a difference for schools, villages, people. SCS 17 is bringing enough power to help bridge that gap. It will also have help addressing markets like mobility platforms. Uh, the days when we could sort of isolate ourselves in the plane, I think, are, are gone now. And slowly, but as we start flying and, and seeing people again, I think the ability to be connected in planes or cruise ships uh, is going to be essential. And, and it's not just about the business person that is picking up a business flight from Frankfurt to New York. Remember, in commercial maritime, for example, we have crews of people, 30 to 40 people will manage a large container uh, fleet. They are away from their families, from their folks, uh, 30 to 40 days uh, continuously. And it's ever more important to make sure that they can, you know, reconnect with their loved ones. They can be in touch. It's and it, I realized after actually meeting with the U.S. Navy uh, that it, it, the problem is more acute nowadays because sometimes when these ships, commercial or you know the U.S. Navy or the French Navy as an example, when they they stop for uh, supplies or, or for something at, at a particular port, the sailors are not allowed out. Right, In many cases they are not. So uh, what was you know uh, a, a long time uh, in isolation is now even longer. So space connectivity provided by platforms like SCS-17 and our new medium Earth orbit, O3BM power, are really key to bridge that gap. With O3BM power, uh, which, and for those that are not familiar with space, you have different orbits, right? You have the highest orbit, and, and the trade-off is simple. The higher you are, the more of the Earth you cover. So you have a geo-orbit where you can cover one third of the Earth. However, you need more power and the latency, the delay is, is higher. The lowest you are, you have less latency, but you cover just small slices of the Earth. Uh, so you need many more satellites and it's uh, way more complex than with a single satellite. And in the middle, uh, it is where Luxembourg and SES have been investing, is what we call the MEO orbit. So with three geosatellites, you can cover the whole Earth. With hundreds or thousands of satellites, you can cover the whole Earth in so-called low Earth orbit, uh, a, a, a little bit below the space station. Now in MEO, medium Earth orbit, with six satellites, you can cover the orbit. And you have very good response times, very good latency. So the latest investment that SES has made is on new digital processing technology that allows you in real time, within seconds, to put power and bandwidth closer to the Earth where it's needed. It follows where the, where the need is. Many of you would have seen that you know, there are these waves of planes that go that come from the US to Europe and, uh, and they 
arrive early in the morning and then they leave in the afternoon in the other direction. You have to have a satellite system that is able to provide connectivity that follows the users, follow the traffic. And you have to do that in real time. And I'm really proud that on space innovation, we are at the forefront of that, providing great capabilities to mobility platforms, to the digital, cross the digital divide, to the unconnected, to disaster relief. We couldn't be better positioned in Luxembourg and at SES to, to capitalize and help on that. But as I said, th this is not just about space. It, 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 you have to connect it on the ground. And on that, SES has been advocating consistently an open architecture. We shouldn't try to pin our users to a particular set of hardware or to particular equipment. We should allow them to evolve the system. And the drive of open architecture is to virtualize a lot of the platforms, the modulators and modulators that we have on the ground. We are working with partners such as Microsoft and platform providers on the ground to make it virtual, to move it to the cloud. So that if you, if you, have, you always need, you know, a physical antenna, electronic or, or, or mechanical, but the rest of the equipment can either be virtualized on, 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 on a very simple hardware platform. And on the receiving side, it can be co-located with a data center and be completely virtualized as well. That will change the cost equation, the availability and the speed of innovation because you don't need to go to hundreds of places to just change a piece of hardware kit. You can do that remotely with your customers, with your users. That's where the innovation is on new ground. It's speeding up this uh, virtualization, this ability to evolve the technology and catch up and keep up with what we are flying and what we will be flying in space. And of course, that doesn't happen. It's not just about the commercial models and the business models and developing the frontline technology. We need to continuously think about what comes next. And again, I think we in Luxembourg, we have a good edge. We have a thriving research and development scene in Luxembourg. We at SES, we work very closely with the Luxembourg University and SNT. The level of investment from our government and from SES on space technologies and ground technology has been steadily increasing. Every year, we do a little bit more, and the results show. I, I can proudly sort of uh, say that we'll be announcing uh, a new, uh, an extension of our broad partnership with SNT pretty soon. So I, I'll not go into details, but this is just a testament to the enduring relationship that we have with academia. And, and to be fair, not only in Luxembourg, but Luxembourg, they are our, our partner and they are really agile and they work closely with us. But we do have agreements with a couple of other universities, one in the US, for example, MIT. But it's good that right here next door, we can just be quicker. And we, we can think further afield. I mentioned very briefly uh, quantum key distribution in space. It, it, it's a well-known or relatively well-known problem that we have to keep our communication secure. And quantum keys are the next step that will make, quite frankly, vital commercial or government communication immune from eavesdropping in an age of quantum computing. That's why they come together, right? The new power that quantum computing unleashes also has security challenges. Therefore, uh, we have been quietly investing with the Lex uh, government on quantum key distribution. Now, there is a terrestrial component. You can distribute quantum keys terrestrially, but there are limitations because it's an optical distribution. So you have limitations in terms of distance. So if you want to have a true all-encompassing quantum key distribution system, you need a space component. And I'm proud to say that we are working really closely with, uh, with the EC, with the European community, with the Lux government, and with the European Space Agency on having uh, a demonstration satellite flying that will actually demonstrate the technology, like other countries have done. We should not be shy from mentioning that 
China uh, is a bit ahead in terms of already having a, a, a satellite flying that uh, trials this technology. But we are in a good position to speed up and, and catch up. And that's, uh, again, a reason uh, to be really proud. Because quite frankly, from an industrial perspective, it's not clear how we are going to commercialize that. But we know it's important and we know institutions, financial institutions, governments will be looking at that and cloud providers as well. So the opportunity is there, even though if we not, cannot quantify it, we have to look for and be adventurous. Okay, so, so Rui, just to, to say that the, the, the clock is already red, so uh, uh, launch has taken place, but uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to, 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 to close your, your address. And, and that's right on time, Jean-Jacques, that's right on time. I was about to, to wrap up. New space and new ground are here with us. We need unconventional thinking. We need to be innovative. Quantum communications, Earth observation, connectivity for the moon, space mining, and all those initiatives. They are key for us to thrive, not only in Luxembourg, but in the space industry in general. ESA, NASA, the Luxembourg Space Agency, the Lux government, the European Union, it's amazing how they are working uh, together despite the difficulties in, in aligning all those partners. So the, the future is really exciting and I'm really proud and glad that I had the opportunity to overrun the clock a little bit, Jean-Jacques. So thank you very much okay. for the opportunity. No, thank you. It was very nice to uh, to see you and uh, bon courage for the last preparation of your uh, launch, uh, your coming launch. Uh, uh, so thank you. I, I, I am taking your point that... Uh, New space is not only space, but also ground. And I think that the uh, combination of new space and new ground is important. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, ju just a plea, uh, Rui, I don't know if you are still there, but uh, uh, you, you, you are speaking of connectivity. And uh, I, I would like to, to raise a point that I, I raised already years ago to, to use the, the, the capabilities of satellites to, to bring education to all children of the world. The, the, the businessmen in, uh, in planes are obviously important because the, they, they are paying customers, but uh, I would like to, to, take, uh, to use the capabilities offered by space to bring education to uh, every ch child in the world. And that is certainly something that uh, we should try to do all together. And uh, speaking of... Uh, What's next? I think that what's next is just to make a new space looking old. So thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Monsieur Andreas Ein. Yes, uh, professor at the University of Luxembourg, who will tell you how space resources can save the Earth. Uh, so the floor is yours. So look at the clock yourself. Take a moment and think about your vision of the future as a child. I think this vision certainly didn't look like this. No. Landscapes on fire. News dominated by extreme weather events. Potentially in a few decades, large parts of the earth uninhabitable. Climate change. How can we escape this future? One vision for escaping this future that has been proposed is to go into space, to settle other celestial bodies on a large scale. Can we do that? Is this realistic? It turns out that this vision of the future grossly underestimates what Earth provides to us. Think about it. 
a lot of the things we take for granted, the earth, the air we breathe, the food we eat, even things we do not think about in our everyday life, such as air pressure and gravity, have to be provided artificially when we go to space. And we only recognize that these things are missing if we go to places such as space, where we have to create these things artificially. This is the International Space Station, the ISS, which is hosting several astronauts and cosmonauts over months and years. It is about the size of a football field and it provides all of these things except for gravity artificially. This is the most sophisticated space system we have ever developed. Nevertheless, the ISS is not independent of Earth. It is connected to Earth via an invisible umbilical cord in the form of spacecraft supplying the ISS with new resources. This means that living in space will always be much more costly than living on Earth, because all of the things which Earth provides to us, essential for free, have to be generated in space artificially, and this costs a lot. Sustaining the life of astronauts on the ISS costs dozens or maybe hundreds of millions per year. Hence, this vision of migrating into space on a large scale does not seem realistic and feasible. What is the alternative vision? On this image, you can see on the foreground an asteroid being mined, the resources being used for developing this kilometer scale structure, a so-called solar power satellite, bringing down energy from space to Earth via microwaves and lasers. This is a vision of the future from the past. The year 2000 imagined in 1977. Can we go back to this future? It turns out that this future has already begun. This is an image of a spacecraft developed by Spire, a spacecraft the size of a shoebox, and hundreds of these spacecraft, or over 100 of these spacecraft, are operated in space, collecting a variety of data of Earth such as the weather and traffic. For instance, the degree of drop in air traffic due to COVID and therefore the drop in greenhouse gas emissions was estimated with the help of this type of data. SNT, the University of Luxembourg, is also working on such miniaturized space systems such as this spacecraft, a CubeSat, which provides or might provide in the future data about flood risk and predicting floods. Now, why are we talking so much about data? Data is the most important resource in space today because it essentially co doesn't cost that much to transfer it from place A to B at the speed of light. However, that might not be remain that way. In the future, we can imagine that these miniaturized spacecraft, dozens or hundreds of them, could be used to mine celestial bodies such as asteroids collaboratively. These spacecraft would collaborate and thereby mine resources and provide these resources to places in space to stimulate the space economy and the space ecosystem. They might even provide high value resources from space to Earth, such as platinum, and thereby mitigate some of the environmental impact of the terrestrial mining industry. Such a space infrastructure might even be the basis for much more audacious, audacious systems where hopefully we will never need them, such as this system, which is called space-based geoengineering or planetary sunshade. We have millions of these sailcraft which are blocking, with the surface area of Germany, blocking a tiny fraction of sunlight and thereby decreasing the temperature 
on Earth. So hopefully we will never use this type of system, but it might support us and mitigate uh, fighting climate change, for instance, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Hence, this is the alternative vision of space, where space actually helps us in order to support humanity on Earth long term. What are we doing at the University of Luxembourg, SNT? We're working on miniaturized space systems, for instance, CubeSats, but also spacecraft which are more, much, more, much smaller than CubeSats, which are the size of a credit card or even a postage stamps, so-called atosets and chipsets. These spacecraft are operated in dozens or hundreds and provide an opportunity to collect new forms of data. We can also think about using these miniaturized space systems in order to mine celestial bodies such as asteroids or the lunar surface. These resources can subsequently be used for venturing out for more, much more audacious space systems, which can have a much, more, much larger impact on how we can be sustainable on Earth. Would you like to know more? You can contact me under this address, and I will also be here at ICT Spring today and tomorrow. We are bound to Earth. We cannot escape Earth. Space is an incredibly hostile place for life. However, space might also hold the key to our long-term survival on Earth. This blue marble in the infinite darkness of space. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I must say that, uh, yes, uh, as you know, I am a strong believer in the use of space resources and uh, thanks, to, thanks to Luxembourg. And, uh, and I must say that uh, since we have spoken of the Artemis uh, program, I think that the lunar base uh, is interesting because it provides a sense of urgency to the use of space resources. Uh, because so far we were bound to the fact that it looked uh, very far away. Uh, but uh, there is no lunar base without the utilization of lunar resources. Impossible to, 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 to look at a lunar base by bringing every kilogram, every liter from, from planet Earth. So it gives a sense of urgency to space resources. And it will make of the moon a laboratory of the utilization of space resources, which later on, could, uh, could break the, the finite character of planet Earth because, uh, unfortunately, we are on a finite planet Earth, even if uh, many of us are considering that planet Earth is infinite and that we are using uh, resources as if there was infinite resources. Unfortunately, there is no infinite resources on planet Earth. So, uh, Thank you very much for your, uh, uh, your presentation. I think that uh, this is certainly a question of survival. So now we go to the next uh, round, uh, which is, uh, I shall have to give the floor to uh, Nelson Pinto from the Luxembourg Ministry of the Economy uh, to... Uh, to, to drive the next, uh, the next uh, session, which is uh, uh, an interesting title, which is connecting with startups worldwide. So the floor is yours. Hey, startups, did you know it's the perfect time to put Luxembourg on your radar? Propel your business to the next level in the very heart of Europe and take advantage of a fast-growing startup ecosystem, an international and business-friendly environment, easy access to corporate decision-makers, and public authorities with a clear digital focus. Start to build your international team now. As a company with international ambitions, being based in Luxembourg comes with quite a few benefits. Luxembourg is a very international place with people being international-minded, speaking multiple languages, 
but also the geographic situation offers an easy access to many European countries. People say you can't bring top talent into Luxembourg. You absolutely can. The small scale actually helps us bring some of the most amazing talent. And sometimes it can be way less competitive than some of the biggest European hubs. Luxembourg is your perfect gateway into European markets. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Luxembourg Trade Investment Office session connecting with startups worldwide. So my name is Nelson Pinto and I work in the startup department at the Ministry of the Economy in Luxembourg. The Luxembourg Trade Investment Offices, or LTIO as we call them, are a network of nine offices spread all over the world in different cities such as New York, San Francisco, Tokyo or Shanghai. Uh, one of the main objectives of the LTIO, LTIOs is to promote Luxembourg in the world in order to attract foreign companies or investments to Luxembourg. On the other hand, the LTIOs can also help and facilitate the access to international markets for Luxembourg-based companies. For this session, uh, three startups active in the space sector and that are interested um, in coming to Luxembourg have been selected from the LTIO network all around the globe. Each of the startups uh, will have five minutes to present their company and their solution. So let's get started with the first company, which is Tensor Tech from Taipei, who developed a spherical motor technology for satellites and which will be presented by the CEO, Thomas Yen. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, hello, my, my name is T uh, Thomas and I'm the CEO of Tensor Tech. And today is my honor to be invited to here to share with you guys about uh, our technology and then the solution we are building. So uh, actually we are targeting for the satellite bus for cube satellites. So actually our customers who build uh, satellites, uh, their business model is to sell these data uh, in, in Earth, but uh, they need to have some sensors like cameras uh, to capture data from space. And then so they can sell these data in, on Earth. So uh, our objective is to provide our uh, customers with small payload volumes so that they can install more cameras or install a better cameras uh, so that they can uh, extract uh, uh, better data or resources from a uh, space and then uh, so and provide them with a reliable satellite bus. So we found that minimization is one of the key to make our customers to uh, install more payloads. And we found that uh, attitude control system is one of the key components that cannot be shrink uh, its size because of uh, physics limitations. Uh, because uh, every satellite, they, uh, in fact, they need uh, uh, the three reaction wheels or four reaction wheels to control its attitude. And the mass of these reaction wheels, uh, uh, they, they, they need a certain mass in the proportion to the total mass of the satellites. So this uh, mass of the reaction wheels cannot be shrink due to this physics limitation. So uh, by figuring out this, uh, this problem, we pro uh, propose a spherical motor solution. Uh, as you can see from the, in the picture on the left-hand side, uh, there's the traditional solution for the CubeSat attitude control. So people require uh, single axis reaction wheels, and then they need magnet talkers to have the uh, three axis attitude control. But uh, we found uh, this solution uh, occupy too many weight and the volume from the satellite. So then we build this uh, spherical motor technology. So in fact, this is a kind of a control moment gyro, but it's drive by a spherical motor. So uh, unlike traditional motors that rotate only in a single axis, like they can only do the clockwise rotation or counterclockwise rotation, this uh, spherical motor can spin in the X, Y, and Z axis uh, so that it can provide angular momentum in uh, nearly any direction. So it can effectively reduce the size of a uh, attitude control system for our customers' satellites. So we hope this kind of solution can help the people realize a uh, more compact satellites that can have uh, more powerful functionalities and then to extract more value from space. So uh, now our company is uh, 
based in Taiwan, and we have a, a couple of a series of products, uh, including a com attitude control components, and then also integrated attitude control system, as well as uh, some uh, services regarding with uh, attitude control. And then and now actually, uh, the reason why we are here is that we are seeking for a place for us we can develop international business. And then we believe that's uh, our next uh, obstacles to, to overcome is how to do the, the sales in space industry and then uh, to make more people know about our solution and then to let them know there are a alternative solution for the attitude control. And uh, in, in, the, in the future, we, we aim to develop a larger satellites like a micro sets, small sets, ADCS using a separate motor technology. Yeah, so... Uh, our company originated in a university in Taiwan named the National Chenggong University. And then uh, there was an uh, opportunity that our laboratory helped the National Space Organization in, in my country to build the single axis reaction wheel. And then we found this traditional solution occupy many uh, volume weights from satellite. So that's why we proposed this separate motor technology. And then, uh, then we spin out from the from our laboratory and then start up this tensor tech, and uh, yeah, we we finished uh, several like uh, ground tests, including vibration, uh, thermal vacant, uh, radiation tests with the uh, uh, space facilities in the country, and then also uh, we have a uh, proof of concept mission with a European company, Set Revolution, this year uh, by the end of uh, December to uh, to validate our solution in space. Yeah, we hope uh, our, uh, our effort can make uh, space be more accessible for humankind. And uh, that's uh, my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, let's go over to the, to the second company, which is uh, Ten Chijin from Tokyo, uh, providing a land evaluation engine for agricultural players by integrating satellite data, geodata, and human knowledge. Um, Yuhei Yurabe, Global Business Development Manager, should be connected. Can yeah, you hear can us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can I start? Yes, you have five okay. minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for giving us uh, such great opportunity to present our solution to the audience in uh, ICT Spring. Tenchijin needs providing solution by using satellite data and AI. We are founded, uh, the, the Tenchijin was founded two years ago as a one of the JAXA startup. And we are recognized as a, one of the top 10 tech-based startup and also top space tech startup in Japan. The problem we are solving is radio frequency congestion problem. As everyone knows, now on the orbit, a lot of satellites and also the number of the satellite will increase rapidly. But because of the limited resources of the radio frequency and also limited capacity of the ground station to transfer more, more uh, the, the large amount of the data between satellite and ground station, satellite and users and satellite and satellite is more and more, and more difficult. And then the needs from the users also rising, right? The quality of the, the network, latency, the needs is all, all the time increasing, rising. So for the satellite operator, it is more difficult to provide high quality network, low rate latency, uh, the communication and so on. So we'd like to solve this issue. And then there are two key challenges to make a stable communication. One is the impact from the rain, the weather, because more and more satellites are using high bandwidth, right? Like a KA band, but it's affected a lot by the weather situation. If weather is becoming bad over the ground station, satellite cannot be connected. So satellites have to deal with this difficult situation and we are developing the solution to predict radio wave attenuation for each radio uh, ground station and then support satellite to select best ground station to communicate with. Then satellite can maximize the capacity to transfer the data. 
how it works is we use uh, satellite Earth observation data and some weather data from the ground, and then using machine learning, we uh, predict uh, precipitation and radio wave attenuation, and then support satellite to select best ground station to communicate with. And then satellite can like uh, make a better communication. Second challenge is the changing the demand. Now, more and more flight have uh, in-flight connectivity, but the uh, demand for each area is changing like, uh, all the time. And then once the demand in specific area rising rapidly, all the connection becoming slow or stop. So satellites ha have to deal with the, this changing the demand. And then we are predicting demand for each area and then support to allocate right amount of the radio wave for each area. How it works is we use the flight tracking data and the flight plan data and then using machine learning and adding some additional uh, algorithm, we predict uh, the flight density for each area, amount of the demand. And then we support to allocate right amount of the radio band videos to each area. And then the flight connectivity can be smooth and then maximize the capacity. We are now developing this solution with these four key player in a space tech in Japan, like NICT, uh, Mitsubishi Electric, University of Tokyo, and University uh, of Tohok. And we have developed basic algorithm and functionality already last year, and now we are developing a solution. And in this solution will be used for the satellite ETS-9 at 20, uh, 2023 which was operated by Japanese Ministry of Internal, National, Internal Affairs and Communications. But at the same time, we'd like to provide this solution to other companies. So I did some research about the needs for this uh, solution. And I found that response was really good. There are a lot of needs for this solution. So I'm looking for the collaborator to develop the solution together, like uh, in-flight connectivity providers, satellite operators, and ground station operators. So if you are interested in this solution, please feel free to contact me. I'd like to talk in deeper together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now let's go over to the third and final uh, company, which is uh, Patch Conix from Tokyo, developing low-cost propulsion systems for satellites, and which will be presented by Dr. Junishiro Kawaguchi. Um, our company picture? is in the, the patch of Conex, you know, derived from space. But uh, you know, despite uh, your introduction, that today's talk you know, is not on space, okay? You introduced us and the propulsion and the fabricator, but uh, that is not true, too. <laughs> so uh, it, today's topic is under the uh, you know, uh, kind of an uh, energy manage management system that derived from the, the space. So this is the background of the, uh, you know, the, that and the pro program. Okay, the, the this and the technology studied developed derived from the, the uh, space, hypers spacecraft. All most of the all the spacecraft and the suffer from that kind of the uh, uh, peak of the uh, power consumption, and that threatens and the power availability. Since and the uh, amount of the power availability is limited by the, the solar panel. So our technology is under the uh, is under the autonomous distributed and independent control scheme derived from Hibisa. It's widely applicable to everything that flows flux, electricity, and so on. The, even the train operation was examined, you know, from, by the, this technology already, right? So how this is different is that usually that the, you know uh, the control is performed by that by a server for, server client scheme. You know, so conventional server client schemes you know requires bilateral communications with all with all clients, but our system is different in the it requires only one way com communication traffic and the control speed is never slowed down even with infinite number of clients. He has shown the time example of the applications for that the power consumers are scattered in, in nationwide and uh, continental wide. Now here's only one broadcast station that, you know, that transmits under the information about the demand surplus or deficit that is received by the, each client. And each client is, it has only to control it, uh, their, uh, its power or, you know, only independent of other, you know, the power consumer. 
that is applicable to the, the uh, you know, uh, regenerative power system or an EV, electric vehicle uh, system. One way communication with no server is a technology we have developed and our goal is to streamline the infrastructure to have efficient energy manage management system. This is under the typical of the EV station, looks like a bacon, right? But and, uh, if a large number of EVs try to charge their battery quickly, the EV stations collapse with extreme uh, the payment to cost in build for uh, the peak demand. But here's uh, the typical example of an uh, uh, EV station, you know, the, the, which has a demand plan of the 100 kilowatts. So suppose on one, you know, the vehicle requests on 40 kilowatts, one request on the vehicle requests on 30 kilowatts, one request on the 350 kilowatts. Easily is that the power balance, you know, collapse, you know, into the, uh, you know, the EV station is built in a huge amount of money, right? So how to manage the charge current? Inquiring needs and preferences and cooperative coordination of all those clients are required, such as via bilateral communications. The parts to connect says no. So such management is an old fashioned and you know, you know, and the uh, you know, but under our you know technology is under the automated distributed and independent control system. That is the difference. Here's an example of EV's network, electric vehicles network, you know, the, uh, here's the one broadcaster that transmits on the power deficit on the surplus information to the, the uh, EV stations. And the EV station has only to, you know, control its demand, you know, the independently of other, other you know, EV stations. And the, uh, here's a management center that gives on the, some of the strategy on the information targets. And the density heavy communication requires requirements have prevented EV stations from, you know, the network, EV station network from being constituted so far. So past technology eliminates the communication burden and realize the EV stations network with real-time demand control in nationwide and continental, continent-wide easily. So the, here's also another the, the further the, the applications to the, the EVs, EVs network. In, you know, in this case, and the, those EV stations can be is connected to the, the uh, community energy management system consisting of the degenerative power. Okay, the, the, yeah, by by by, by a technologies combined with the vehicle to home to vehicle to home technology and also the, the regenerative power resources. EV stations network constitutes a kind of a community energy management system to the nationwide and continent-wide easily. So quick turnaround requests on the EVs with empty battery shall be given high priority. And the EVs that come in late you know, shall be given the high priority. On the other hand, payment should be the, the, the dependent on the high, you know, the, uh, the charge current. So the payment should be higher for high charge current so cheating may happen, right? But uh, the answer is no. This is how the users request the priority for preference. So those who declare a low, you know, demanding amount of uh, amount of battery, trying to finish on the charge quickly, they are billed on a higher, you know, the uh, payment with reduced you know, the charge time. On the other hand, those who intentionally declare higher, you know, the uh, amount, demanding amount of battery, trying to lower the payment, they may not, you know, complete on the, char the charge. Such automated bidding coordination is embedded with EA energy management system by a patch connect technology. Patch connect that technology does realize the efficient and cost effective energy management that does comprise with a carbon neutral world. So patch connect looks at and the partners with us and solicit the investments. Okay? The global trend has now plunged into the, the carbon neutral. How the energy, high energy as well as the infrastructure are used is of great concern to everyone. Passive Connex technology does provide the efficient energy management to nationwide continental solution very easily. Here's on the patented in Europe, as you know already. So that let me you know they show that let me have that some of the interest, you know, from all the audience audience today. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'd like to thank all three companies for the very interesting pictures. Um, do not hesitate to get in touch with the companies uh, if you wish to have additional information. Um, that's it on my side from the LTIO session. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you uh, very much. I must say that I am glad because uh, Monsieur Kawaguchi was uh, uh, 
colleague, a colleague uh, some time ago, and we have worked together, and it's good to see him uh, as a start startup now. So now, uh, I uh, call uh, Monsieur Seminari, Simon, from Euroconsult, who will uh, give us uh, uh, his views on the space economy and government space budget. So uh, I am. I shall stay next to you to look at the clock. So uh, the floor is yours. But uh, voila, uh, yeah, two. Is it. Voila. Thank you. Um, let me see if this works. Okay. So the title today, I'll be speaking a few minutes. I'm aware of the time. I will zip along as quickly as possible. We'll be speaking today about the space economy and government space budgets. It's a bit of a misnomer because the space economy is comprised of commercial space um, uh, revenues as well as government space budgets. So my name is Simon. I'm a consultant at EuroConsult. Um, so today we'll be I have about 15 minutes. We'll cover these three topics. So first, an over you know, high level view of the space industry as it exists today. And then we'll focus on the commercial space revenues on one hand, as well as the kind of the institutional context. So it's a bit cut off at the bottom, unfortunately, but um, so the government side and the commercial side. Um, a bit of uh, shameless uh, self-promotion. So your consult um, has been in business about 30 years. We are based in Paris with offices around the world. And we have these four business lines, uh, consulting, market intelligence, customized training, as well as events. Um, and we are independent and focus exclusively on the space sector. And we specialize in sort of data-driven analysis of the space sector. So some high-level KPIs. So uh, this year was quite phenomenal. It was obviously in the middle of a global health pandemic. Nevertheless, we saw a, a world record broken uh, amounts of satellites launched. So over a thousand satellites launched. We've seen satellite orders actually pick up. So up to 60% in orders, commercial satellite orders uh, in 2020. And the value, phenomenal growth over 130%. Uh, the launch sector is, is a bit delayed. Um, so it's following up, uh, we, but we expect the launch sector to, to catch up because usually um, an operator will order the satellite first and then a few years later, once it's been built, they secure their, their launch. Um, so this is kind of a historical view. I'm sorry it's cut off at the bottom, but essentially we can see this phenomenal growth, especially in 2020, largely due to Starlink, but not only. Uh, so we kind of did a world record uh, break this year of over 1,000 satellites launched, of which 93% are small sats. So these are satellites under fi uh, 500 kilos in size. And of those, 65% were SpaceX, the Starlink mega constellation. So a couple of kind of high level trends. So as I said, um, looking over the next decade, so from now until the end of the decade, we're not this, this sort of, you know, 1,000 satellite launch milestone is not a one time event. We're expecting every year to average over 1,000 satellites for now until the foreseeable future. Um, there is a pretty strong concentration. So we're expecting kind of a five fold increase uh, in launches over the decade. Uh, quite concentrated in these four, these so-called mega constellations. So I'm sure you've all heard of SpaceX, uh, Amazon Kuiper, OneWeb, and so on. Um, so on the bottom left, so small sats are quite impressive in, in terms of number. So nine out of 10 satellites will be small sats. However, in terms of value, these are just kind of low cost mass produced satellites. They only represent about a fifth of the market in terms of actual value. Um, and then as you see in the bottom, left, bottom right here, uh, despite this increasing commercial activity in space, governments still re retain a very important and kind of preponderant role in space and they represent 80% of the demand in value. So we have kind of a breakdown. So mega constellations uh, are kind of, you know, talking about just small sats themselves. Uh, there's a pretty strong, you know, 50% of all small sats will be in these mega constellations. And then there's kind of a distribution over, over other kind of architectures. And on the right here, you see the application. So these small sats, the past decade, so 10 years in the past, 40% uh, of these small sats were basically technology demonstration. So they're basically testing the technology. Whereas in the next, sorry, it's a bit cut off. In the next decade, we're shifting to a much more diverse uh, kind of operational satellites and far fewer are basically demonstrators. We're seeing basically the transition from demonstrating the technology to basically providing operational uh, services uh, in constellations and, and across kind of a wide spectrum of different types of constellations, of, of applications. And so people might think, oh, this is brand new. We've never seen this before. This is sort of, you know, a new era for space. But actually, maybe there's some people old enough in the room to remember this. If we go back, you know, in the 80s or 90s, we actually... You know, some, another speaker talked about back to the future. This is in effect happening. Uh, we did see kind of a, a much smaller wave of satellite systems in 
uh, constellation architecture. Uh, most of those proposed systems uh, no longer exist today. They failed, but some have stuck around. So you see Iridium, Globalstar, and so on. Uh, and also, of course, once somebody says, I want to launch all satellites, launch providers, you know, line up to, to say, we will, we will launch our satellites. And so in the 80s and 90s, there was also a large amount of, of launch, uh, launcher or launch vehicle uh, projects. Unfortunately, you know, the bonanza didn't really pay off. It didn't, it didn't kind of, you know, lift off, so to speak. So there was a period where the numbers went down. But today we're seeing this resurgence, this sort of, you know, renaissance in interest. So there are literally hundreds of constellation projects not all of which, of course, will actually take off. The market can't sustain all these projects, uh, but there's sort of a lot of dynamism in the market. We're seeing uh, you know, over, almost about 100 or so um, actual launch vehicles. So many of these are small sat, or small launch vehicles, micro launch vehicles that will you know, propose to, to launch these satellites into orbit. The only thing which is actually brand new is this proliferation of launch sites. So spaceports, commercial spaceports, government spaceports, Almost every day you see some new U.S. state or some country saying we want to build a, a spaceport and attract a piece of this market. So this is quite new, which we didn't see uh, back in the 80s and the 90s. And then kind of to, to close up this section, um, the space industry, there's, there's basically, you know, in flux, a revolution all across the industry. Uh, kind of these two main forces, we see sort of this market pull. So as the space sector becomes less of a government-dominated area and more of a commercial uh, arena, we're seeing kind of this market pull, so different drivers, different business models, different profitability uh, sort of logics. And then we're also seeing this technology push, so a rapid explosion in technology capabilities, which is having, uh, you know, kind of, you know, big, big changes impacting, uh, disrupting the, uh, the, the, the space ecosystem, essentially, across the whole uh, space industry. So now we move over to the, the space economy itself. Um, so you're consulting, you start at the far left. So according to our figures, um, we calculate in 2020, the global, you know, all in space economy to be valued at 385 billion US dollars in 2020. A part of that is government space budgets. So we'll get to that in a second. We'll focus now on the commercial revenues, which are about 315, which remain, of which over 300 billion are in the downstream. So this is basically services. And then about, you know, 10 billion are in the upstream. So basically the manufacture of a, of a commercial satellite uh, the launch of that satellite, and then the, the ground station to, to kind of operate and communicate with that satellite. But the vast majority of profits are basically in the, the downstream. Um, and then some quick, so COVID had, had an impact, of course. We actually saw a 2% commercial revenue decline against 2019. Um, different markets and space were affected differently. So Earth observation actually grew. Uh, SATCOM, some markets, for example, uh, in-flight aero connectivity, so planes and so on, and, and uh, and um, maritime, so cruise and, show and so on, suffered very strongly. Others kind of muddled through. But we actually see to kind of counterbalance this decline in commercial revenues, we've seen that governments have really stepped up and there has been record government uh, space budgets, which we'll get to in a second. So this is basically the revenue distributed across the three main uh, space applications with a commercial presence. So, you know, space exploration exists, but these are we're basically removing government involvement. This is purely commercial private sector revenues generated. So satellite communications is kind of the most robust. There's commercial revenues across the entire value chain. But again, at the very bottom, services is where um, most of the, the, the commercial revenues are generated. EO is similar, so Earth observation is similar. We see you know, a much smaller but emerging commercial market across the entire value chain from you know, commercial providers manufacturing their own satellites and launching them, operating them, and selling, uh, selling data and services. But still, Earth observation remains predominantly government. Most of the clients are governments and typically ministries of defense, so defense uses of EO imagery. And navigation in the middle is quite unique because all satellite navigation systems, so GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, uh, and so on, uh, Beidou in China, these are all government you know, manufactured, built, launch, operated systems. The data is then given for free, and there's an entire, there's a massive ecosystem based off of free satellite navigation signals. Uh, so from your smartphone in your pocket, all the way to drones flying in the sky, all rely on these free uh, satellite navigation signals. We've kind of done a bit of a forecast. Unfortunately, again, you can't really see it, and the important numbers are all at the bottom. So essentially, we, so 315 billion U, U, uh, dollars is the commercial market today in 2020. We forecast in 2025, this number to go up to 400 billion. So you've probably heard of the trillion dollar space economy. We are a little bit more conservative, let's say. Uh, we don't think the growth numbers that are required to, to achieve uh, 100 million or so 1 trillion are feasible, uh, especially with COVID and so on. But we're still forecasting a very respectful growth of about 30% in the next five years or so. 
Um, so space economy is, is here to stay and is not going anywhere anytime fast. And then again, just to wrap up this section on the, the commercial revenue, um, there's basically changes, I won't go through them all number one, but essentially we're seeing uh, changes across the entire value chain. So from upstream, uh, you know, mass production of small sats to, to launch these kind of, you know, small dedicated launch vehicles to, to ride sharing and so on, all the way to also sort of the downstream, uh, both in sort of raw capacity and raw data, but also in the service provision with, with the cloud and AI and data analytics and so on. So, so really, it's not just sort of a, a small pockets of innovation. It is rapid market-driven technology innovation across the entire value chain. So really uh, an exciting time for the space, uh, the space industry. Now we move on to the government space revenue. So I'm, I'm kind of zipping through. I apologize, but I'm happy to kind of answer questions later. This presentation hopefully will be available online later. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot of what governments were spending in space in 2020. Uh, so we have a total of 82 billion uh, US dollars in 2020, obviously dominated by the US, but still a very healthy picture kind of worldwide. Uh, Europe is a bit fragmented. There's some multiple national programs, also ESA, European Union as well, and then um, some other players as well. But I want to emphasize here that the takeaway is that budgets are, are kind of one piece of the puzzle, but there's a lot of additional metrics we should be looking at. So for example, China in 2020 actually launched more satellites than the US. Uh, so you don't see that here, but that's very important. In terms of uh, PPP, so uh, purchase power, uh, purchase parity, uh, PPP, sorry, purchase not, power, not public private partnerships. <laughs> yes, exactly. So PPP. So um, the, the Chinese budget is actually roughly equivalent to the US budget. So obviously $1 goes much further in, the US, in China than it does in the US. So you, you get more bang for your buck. You can buy more technology, hire more engineers, and software, hardware. So you don't only see that. But that's an important metric to keep in mind. And we've seen countries like UAE and India launch essentially you know, very ambitious uh, you know, space exploration missions to Mars on essentially a shoestring budget for very small amounts or one-tenth of what it would cost NASA or ESA to launch a mission, you're seeing these countries launch very sophisticated missions to Mars and beyond. Uh, so there's basically more under the hood than what these numbers show. So some kind of other metrics, which you don't see every day, we're seeing kind of a, the number of countries investing in space increasing dramatically, because um, as they kind of begin to see the barriers to entry lower and the, the, the benefits of investing in space are, are very apparent. We're seeing a shift in the, the profile, so a year, a decade ago, governments spent roughly 50-50 on civil and defense programs. Today, it's roughly 60-40 for, for, for civil. Um, and even so, in the bottom right, you see there's kind of a musical chair. So the leaders today are more or less the same as the leaders 20 years ago. But what's important is this number here. Uh, 20 years ago, these top five represented almost the totality of all government space spending, whereas today that's down to 80%. So the leaders still lead, but they have less of a kind of a hegemonistic position in space. We're seeing more newcomers. Um, I can, I'm go this, I'll kind of flip through the next kind of slide. So this is basically showing countries with operational satellites, a bit of a time lapse. So in 2000, 25 countries. So, you know, a good spread, but still a lot of pockets with countries with, with no space asset. Um, 10 years later, more penetration. Eight years later, more, more activity. And the darker blue represents more activity. And projected for the future, there are few areas in, in the world, even in Africa, and kind of un, un, underdeveloped areas, or less developed areas which are beginning to launch and operate satellites. Um, there's one more important. So we are, we are here in Luxembourg. I didn't, I'd be remiss not to mention Luxembourg. So if you look at government space budget per capita, so how much a government is spending per citizen, as well as the proportion of its GDP. Uh, so Luxembourg is actually number one worldwide in government spending per capita. Um, so it's spending at, at a phenomenal rate of almost $150 uh, per citizen. This places it you know, amongst the leaders, so number one. This is really a testament to the political will of the Luxembourgish uh, you know, political leaders and in this kind of concerted effort uh, to be kind of you know, a, a niche expertise in, in some high, high growth areas. Uh, but it really is a, a strong testament. Uh, in Europe, the European average is, is 20 euros per citizen. And as a percent of GDP, again, Luxembourg is solidly among the top three, uh, you know, rivaling Russia and the US and France and so on, uh, spending about 15 or 0.14% of its GDP on space. Uh, the world average is 0.02, and the European average is 0 0.06. Uh, so really a, a strong testament to the Luxembourg, um, uh, what it's doing in space and the recent kind of interest and important place space is taken in the Luxembourgish um, economy and, and, and kind of uh, focus. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus, uh, sort of last, last two slides will be one civil uh, government kind of uh, you know, area to watch, I suppose, on the, and then one defense one. So on the civil side, we think that the next decade will be 
kind of a golden era or the second golden era of space exploration. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, even in, in, in COVID pandemic times, we saw a year or so ago, uh, four or five Mars missions launched. So NASA, there was kind of, you know, first UAE launched, launched a mission. Uh, Japan had sort of an asteroid sample return, which is, you know, a first, um, as well as, uh, you know, helicopters. So there's, there's lots of things happening in space, the Artemis and so on to the, loon, to the moon. So in the past decade, we saw about 50 space exploration missions launched by governments. In the next decade, we expect that to almost triple to 130 missions with a focus on the moon. The moon is kind of the next destination. And what's new is this, this partnership with the private sector. So it's not governments going out alone. Uh, the private sector is accompanying and partnering with governments in this uh, new, new adventure. And the last slide is the defense. Uh, we're seeing kind of a, an uptick in the militarization of space. This is kind of a big topic. So more and more governments are focusing on, on kind of there's, um, uh, you know, space domain awareness, uh, space, uh, space surveillance and tracking, SSA, space solution awareness. So governments are becoming a bit more nationalistic, realizing that space kind of offers you know, it's sort of the final frontier, the ultimate high ground. And there's a lot of kind of space military uh, policies and strategies. So we see kind of an uptick across a number of metrics, how much governments are spending, how many countries and so on. And the US obviously has been a, a leader in kind of the defense domain and will you know, further that lead over the next decade. Okay, so we've, we've kind of zipped through. I try to respect my time. So thank you everyone for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. You made it. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I would like maybe to, to say something that uh, you, you could not say because of my time pressure, uh, that Euroconsult uh, is uh, organizing uh, the World Satellite uh, Week uh, in December in Paris, and you are, almost, uh, you are obviously all uh, welcome there. It's a very important uh, event. And uh, during that event, and I take uh, the opportunity also to announce that uh, there will be a competition among startups, which is uh, FinSpace. This is the fifth time that uh, there is a challenge among startups. And uh, ju just to say that this year, the, the, the shortlisted startups None of them was existing for the first edition of FinSpace, sh showing a fantastic uh, change in the in the in the space uh, world. So now it's time to uh, to give the floor to Pascale Reinfeind. Uh, so she's uh, the the president of the International Astronautical Federation. So she is more than entitled to speak of international cooperation. But even more than that, maybe uh, she just be appointed president of the International Space University. And as you know, I am uh, a very uh, uh, interested by education because, as I said already several times this morning, education is certainly part of our future. So. Uh, Pascal, the floor is yours. You know that I always said that uh, you are president or director for some time, but you are professor forever. So you are a professor forever. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's actually, I have to honestly say that it's my first time in Luxembourg and I'm uh, really quite astonished. And I have to say, we've heard so many great things today. Um, what I'm touching on uh, is is a little bit uh, a, a summary because um, I have given uh, the topic, which you can see, but uh, I can tell you why collaboration is now the key to exploring space. And uh, I will touch on many things which have been uh, dis discussed today. So I think um, we are all aware, and we have seen it in particular also in the last presentation, how dynamic uh, the space sector is and that it really will play in the future also an increasing role in our life on Earth. We witness this vibrant industrial and public space sector also interacting. We have unprecedented entrepreneurial leadership and private investments and a lot of innovative technologies and a, a young generation, which is really bursting. We have seen that on some of the uh, presentations. So um, I, I think we have already discussed that all this is le leading to a paradigm shift and uh, to a disruption in the space sector. And um, I think we, we all have um, this kind of um, 
will you know in order to bring the space sector further and and uh, we have seen it also on some of the slides. The space sector has been incredibly robust during the uh, pandemic, and uh, compared to other in other in, uh, other industrial sectors. So I don't want to go into those details, but the collaborations which are formed between uh, all the different actors in the space. They, um, are of course, augment because uh, space um, is uh, touching uh, and, 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 and having collaborations with the non-space sector. It is broadening its portfolio and it has a great potential for technology transfer through spin-in and spin-off acti activities in all these kind of uh, new fields which have partly been discussed already from constellation to re reusability on orbit technology, space tourism, and in particular also the development of deep space, uh, which we have uh, just heard. And um, I uh, just want to start with international relations and corporations. This is uh, one of my main fields. I'm current president of the International Astronautical Federation, which is um, uh, celebrates the 70th anniversary this year in Paris in December. It was founded during the Cold War in 1951, and it is the um, world's leading space advocacy body and uh, encompasses, you know, 407 members from all the space agency and space offices, uh, the big industries, uh, universities, museums, uh, uh, associations, research organizations. So this is more or less where uh, the um, uh, everything, um, everybody meets, all the different stakeholders can interact. We have many, many meetings of space, which are mistargeted topics at the International Astronautical Congress, uh, which is um, uh, held annually at a different location. This is where really all the people meet, industry can talk to the startups, to the entrepreneurs. And what I think has changed a lot in the last 10 years um, with the International Astronautical Federation is that 50% of the people, uh, of the participants are under 35. And the diversity, you can also see the diversity has changed. So in the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, the IAF is really also a booming place for, for the young people, for the, the Space Generation Advisory Council, which is there with hundreds of people. And uh, you see also this really this diversity and having also a very large percentage of women in this new generation. And I think uh, uh, that that is always refreshing uh, uh, to go. We will meet in Duba and I must say I cannot make a better advertisement than the, than the Minister of Economy of Luxembourg this morning he just said that he will be in Dubai and I will come back to that. So we will meet in Dubai in, uh, in uh, six weeks from now. And um, so we have participants from 71 countries and uh, our mission is to foster cooperation, to share knowledge uh, and promoting cooperation between, uh, you know, established space actors and emerging countries uh, and, and uh, looking, preparing the workforce of tomorrow and raising space awareness, you know, also politicians, because we actually discuss with all the space stakeholders and also they are present in, in most of our meetings. So there is an exchange between all of them because it is also really important. In Luxembourg, we have seen we have this very, very strong political will, you know, to move uh, the space sector and to move entrepreneurship. This is not the case for all countries uh, worldwide. So we have really to do our task and to convince uh, politicians very often uh, to engage with space because many, uh, as I say, many people type on their iPhone and so on, but I have no connection to uh, the more than 3,000 satellites satellites which are active uh, in space. So um, I, I still want to make uh, one uh, uh, plea for the developing countries. We have seen that there are many uh, new emerging and developing countries uh, out there. There are space agency created and space offices created every year. I've just been in, 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 in Russia where there was the Turkish space agency, which is new and, 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 and many of those organizations. So it's really booming. And uh, of course they need help. They need help in order to um, partner, uh, to uh, understand what is important for their country. They uh, need uh, regional representation and coordination and, 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 and need help with marketing and, and, and communications. And that's what uh, the International Astronautical Federation is really uh, uh, 
uh, specialized on. We just created a new comedy. It's very easy to remember, ACDC, EC, yeah? um, developing countries and emerging communities are uh, really involved and we just decided on our next meeting, uh, which will be, which is quite, quite, uh, how to say, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, it will be in June 2020. Um, to in Ecuador, in Quito, in Ecuador, in order really to also foster this region of, of South America where there are many new uh, um, uh, space agencies uh, which want to be engaged in, in, in future space missions. So um, I have, unfortunately, let me see, I'm, I'm frozen. Yeah, uh, good. Okay, now it's going fast. Uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, uh, space is really um, uh, at the forefront of um, supporting the sustainable development goals, and that brings a lot of co uh, of, of collaborations with the entire non-space sector. Um, uh, space is really has a role in for all the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, and in particular, science and technology and innovation. Um, and the related capacity building um, with, for instance, emerging countries um, uh, really provide essential means to reach uh, the implement of those goals, but also of all uh, uh, improve um, uh, solutions for all those agreements. So if it's zero hunger, uh, where we are providing data from space for agriculture um, or, or um, uh, the climate actions, uh, when you look at every individual goals, the United Nations will tell you space is an essential contributor to that. And I think this is also a very um, important argument for politicians uh, to, um, uh, to contribute, you know, to these uh, sustainable development goals. And um, I'm not exactly sure where I should point, uh, just here. Yeah, okay. Uh, Copernicus is, I think I want just to mention, um, I just come from, from another meeting, is the world's largest Earth observation program. And uh, it is really, um, I would say, an, um, a, a really uh, big base for collaborations all over the world. And I think Europe can be extremely proud of, of what it has achieved in collaboration with the EU, with ESA, with EUMEDSAT and other, other organizations and really providing uh, uh, also collaborations with those open data with the entire world um, uh, to look at our planet and its environment for, for the benefits, uh, not only of European citizens, but all, all cause worldwide. So looking at this entire ecosystem of, uh, you know, atmosphere, marine, land, climate, and security, in particular, emerging uh, uh, and disaster management, which was very important for us. Uh, we have seen what happened this year. I think is a really great uh, example how um, uh, worldwide there is cooperation, and um, also how those immense amount of data which is coming down is uh, uh, flowing into the downstream sector, bringing a new downstream sector uh, uh, into the future, which we have just heard uh, the statistics from Euroconsult. So I think that's a, a really really great example, and another example which we uh, all discuss uh, continuously at all the different meetings is, you know, uh, tracking uh, space debris, looking at um, uh, collision avoidance, looking at, at uh, new technical solutions for uh, active debris removal uh, from space. There is a lot of things going on. And um, you need um, a real uh, broad collaboration about this topic because you need the uh, engineers to develop the technologies uh, uh, in order uh, to uh, uh, address all the topics of space debris. But you need also the space lawyers and uh, space business people to understand how we actually draft agreements from the national point of view to the to finally to have international binding. Uh, 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 requirements uh, at the beginning, at the minimum, uh, and uh, you know, for this space debris mitigation. So it is a really interdisciplinary field and requires interdisciplinary 
uh, collaboration between, you know, uh, the technical side, the space business, and uh, of course also space law and regulations in order to solve this kind of uh, of problem. So they are uh, with those kind of really Im uh, uh, intrinsic uh, um, uh, subjects which we have to solve. We have to, you know, uh, collaborate wildly across the areas. So uh, my last topic is space exploration, since it's my own, my own topic, and I'm really fascinated how it's gonna, uh, how it's moving. And we have heard a very interesting uh, uh, discussion today about uh, the Artemis program uh, from NASA with its international cooperation. We um, uh, we have it's the year of Mars. We have uh, just I think ten hours ago was uh, the uh, uh, twenty four hours ago the first sample. Uh, which was uh, retrieved from the Perseverance rover, which will be put in a, uh, a, a canister and tube sealed for the future mass sample return mission, mission, which is an international endeavor between NASA and ESA and probably other partners. Um, uh, we have um, in, in the asteroid exploration and uh, also in, in sample return missions, we had a really active phase and return of samples from Japan and uh, uh, Ben, uh, uh, on um, Osiris Rex from the NASA mission has just grabbed samples, you know, from asteroid Benny. Uh, looking in our outer solar system, there are a lot of missions done in international cooperation and also looking for other worlds outside in our solar system. So it's so vibrant. I'm actually very happy to be a part of this uh, space exploration sector. And um, uh, it is really a collaboration where also emerging countries start to uh, really make contributions like the HOPE Orbiter, which is currently uh, measuring climate and uh, atmosphere of Mars by the uh, a mission uh, by the United Arab Emirates. And I'm sure they will talk a lot in Dubai about uh, their, their first data. So... Um, I think it uh, it shows uh, that uh, also the space exploration uh, um, sector and the deep space exploration sector is going to grow. We just saw that in the slides of EuroConsult because of this dynamic interaction between a lot of commercial players which are integrated uh, in now in these new space exploration endeavors. And uh, it is uh, even startups which are really helping here, in particular also in the, in the lunar surface program. And we have to say that also uh, um, China and Russia announced an, a new program uh, for the, the International Lunar Research Station. We don't know so many details, but it was presented in St. Petersburg uh, recently. So it is something which actually covers uh, collaborations all over the world. And uh, I want to mention also the International Space Exploration uh, Coordination Group, Isaac G, which is really a forum of space agencies, which has now jumped, you know, from it was always around so 13 to 15 countries, and it has jumped in recent uh, uh, years. Uh, and has now 26 organizations in their co coordination forum. They provide very um, a road mapping, which I think is, is very important because what we want to do is international cooperation. We don't want to duplicate. We want to share cost. We want to um, uh, share and exploit worldwide expertise. Uh, and we want to move forward together and find also interest in international cooperation. So, uh, and uh, this uh, is in particular growing in the global space exploration sector, uh, because also a lot of scientists and engineers are involved, which are used to work a lot uh, internationally. And that implies also to new technologies. We have heard a lot of examples today already from startups. We have a lot of young uh, people which are, have startups which contribute you know, to innovative technologies developed and uh, be it in situ resource utilization, we talked about that today, uh, uh, CubeSats, uh, crawlers, life support, habitat that there is uh, machine, artificial intelligence, robotics, all those technologies, I think um, um, uh, they need these innovative young um, uh, companies which are um, you know, uh, not risk averse and trying something new in order to uh, feed into this deep exploration uh, market. 
So uh, I just want to say a, lot, uh, a short word in order to have, you know, such a booming space sector and sustaining such a booming space sector, we also need a workforce, a workforce of tomorrow for the space sector, which is also really able to uh, um, uh, have uh, this inter interdisciplinary approach and this multi-stakeholder approach to understand. So I, I, uh, I just took over the uh, few days ago uh, the International Space University, which is a 30 years uh, um, uh, success uh, founded by two, uh, uh, actually three, uh, but uh, uh, a very famous space entrepreneurs, Peter Diamandis, Bob Richard, and Todd Hawley. And uh, they had this idea to have an international space campus and to educate um, they had this vision already a long time ago to educate students, you know, interdisciplinary um, uh, in an international environment all over the world. And also, of course, intercultural, um, uh, this, this plays a, a very important role. So uh, there are now 5,200 alumni all over the world. Many of them uh, are entrepreneurs. Some of them are top space entrepreneurs, uh, uh, like, for instance, Bayer and, 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 and Planet. And um, also, uh, due to this international approach and this interdisciplinary approach, ISU contributes a lot to the, the um, exchange uh, of uh, space knowledge uh, in, within the region. And uh, I think it is very important and I'm also uh, uh, really want to acknowledge the great program of Luxembourg and of its master studies because we need a new generation. The STEM workforce is extremely low. We have an incredible lack of uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, STEM employees all over the world. And uh, we have really to act and um, educate um, a, a new space generation to actually conduct and continue all these great, great visions which we are now discussing. So I want to end. Um, I think um, uh, what we have discussed also in particular for the future for the aerospace industry, that partnership is needed because of this multi-stakeholder approach that we have uh, space agencies working together with industry, with SMEs, startups, that we have a strong commercial sector, a strong entrepreneurial sector. And um, in the times of uh, digitalization and industry 4.0, this collaborations are less and less based on this kind of rigid disciplinary uh, uh, boundaries. So uh, it will be an interdisciplinary approach and we have to uh, learn to talk to each other. Like we had, for instance, uh, very new uh, uh, great startups ideas which work for the energy sector, for the transport sector. So this language, you know, has to be learned. And um, I think partnerships between research and industry is extremely crucial in order to uh, foster innovative technologies. I was uh, the previous chair of the European Research uh, uh, Establishment um, uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, which, which com comprises uh, many uh, organizations, uh, research organizations in Europe, and we really made a proposal to roadmap together with the industry uh, for, the Europe, uh, for the programs for the European Commission. I think it is very important to have this strong uh, interaction. And I just want to say it's more important than ever to work together, uh, to combine force, uh, forces and really to support this really vibrant and exciting uh, space sector and entrepreneurship and in particular also the young people because uh, many, many of them, when you make service, want to be entrepreneurs for the future. And I want to just thank you. Uh, 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 please come to Dubai, yeah? as, the, as the minister said this morning, <laughs> uh, we will have the, uh, the IEC 2020. Uh, one in Dubai under the topic Inspire, Innovate and Discover for the Benefit of Humankind and it will be a fantastic um, uh, congress. I am on zero, 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 zero. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, bravo Pascal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so, now we uh, are moving to uh, the next uh, round table which will be a round table on the three components for success, uh, which combine funding uh, and uh, uh, technologies. So I would like to invite uh, the three uh, participants to the round table. Uh, Pierre Festal, uh, Lynn Zunen and uh, Marcus Payer. 
the floor is yours. And if I okay, and if I may, I would like to uh, already uh, tell you that I would like to uh, make uh, the 30 minutes becoming 25 minutes because we have another rendezvous uh, after uh, your uh, round table and uh, uh, I would not like to uh, skip the lunch. Thank you. So the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Jacques. Um, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, Lynn and Pierre. Um, uh, you are venturers, if I may say, and we want to talk about uh, the key success principles that uh, you see when uh, investing in space. Uh, but maybe, uh, Lynn and Pierre, you, you, you say just one little word about uh, what your companies, are, your venture companies are doing. Uh, one sentence each. We don't want to make it a promotional panel here, but we are curious to know uh, what exactly you're doing. So please, Lynn, first. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm with Alpine Space Ventures, which is a new, a new space focused venture capital fund that we launched earlier this year. You may know the people that lead the fund. Um, we have Christian Angermeyer, who is currently one of the most influential, uh, influential tech uh, investors in Europe. We have Bill and Altan, the man behind the reusable rocket at SpaceX. Uh, Hans Königsmann, the man behind pretty much everything SpaceX does. Um, and then we also have Joram Völklein, who's set up um, the largest asset manager for um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And what we invest into mainly is data and connectivity, because those are the areas where we see uh, most potential in the short term. Thank you. Uh, impressive. Um, Pierre. Sorry. Yeah, you have to share the mic. Hi. Maybe there's another one. But... Hi, I'm Pierre. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a partner at uh, Orbital Ventures and Promise Ventures in the US. Um, we are an early stage deep tech investor uh, that's been investing across a variety of sectors uh, over the last 10 years and more specifically uh, in the space uh, and new space sectors uh, for the last six or seven years. Um, we also manage a um, space focused fund called Orbital Ventures. Uh, based here in Luxembourg, uh, where we back primarily early stage startups across the uh, space value chain. Uh, we have a team here in Luxembourg and in the US. Um, we invest primarily in the European Union as well as in the rest of the world. Great. Uh, I hope, Lynn, that your mic is working now. So we... Yes, it does. Um, let's come to our topic. Um, there is a huge wave of investment uh, from private uh, investors in space uh, since quite some time. It's like several floodgates opened uh, and investors' appetite uh, seems to be endless. Um, where is this appetite coming from and what is actually driving it? And maybe it is also a question to you because you are investing in space. Where is your appetite coming from? Maybe Lynn first. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I think that the, the first big trend that I currently see in the industry is very much that space is becoming more and more of a tangible market um, for uh, industries that are beyond the space realm. And also it's moving closer to the consumer. So that's the first exciting trend I can see. Um, the second, I think, is less on the technology side itself, but more on the tech approach side of things um, with miniaturization, the use of commercial off the shelf components, um, but also a, a new approach to, to production with serial production that's enabled to, uh, through 3D printing. And then I think that the third big one that I can see is, um, and that's particularly exciting, is industry consolidation. And that's something that's happening because industry incumbents are facing uh, real competition from new space actors. And, um, you know, SpaceX is a really good example in that regard, because when Airbus was offered shares, um, when they had that opportunity, um, they, they passed on it. And I think that this is something that will not happen in the future again, um, because we reached a point um, of, let's say, awareness of new space capabilities. Um, so I see uh, a rise of, of m and activities in the future. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Pierre, you share that view? or um, Yes, I think broadly um, I would add that uh, you know, space is 
one of these legacy large state industries uh, which is getting disrupted like you know pretty much every single industry under the sun nowadays um, this is this has really been made possible by you know convergence of a bunch of technologies and the maturity of those technologies and then some very bold, and ambitious entrepreneurs uh, who are making it happen. You know, same way we've seen, um, you know, in areas like automotive with electric vehicles and other other industries. Um, I think the last um, thing I will mention is also, you know, a, a broader uh, a set of market conditions, particularly uh, the record amounts of liquidity which are permeating into private markets right now. And obviously, that money is trying to find homes um, and yield and risky and potentially very lucrative endeavors. And in that sense, you know, space is also, you know, representing the, the last frontier of, of tech investing. You both uh, seem to say in a way that um, uh, what is interesting for investors is the re relevance of space on Earth, for technologies on Earth. You said end consumer, um, um, uh, other technologies, um, automotive, all these things. Are you interested really in this angle that you look at space investments uh, as, as they might create market and relevance on Earth and technologies and systems on Earth? Or are you ju also looking at just outer space? Or is this maybe not the right alternative to describe? Lynn, what do you think? Um, well, I would say that we invest into whatever um, will go commercial in the next couple of years. And um, in sectors where, or in technologies where you have a clear path to commercialization and where you have demand. And currently we can see that um, obviously in the space industry, you, you would find sellers, but we, we see a lot of interest in, in other industries. When you look at um, uh, downstream uh, satellite data, um, everyone wants to make data-driven decisions, right? Um, you see that in agriculture, you see that in maritime, you see that in logistics. Um, so I think that there is a, a convergence between space and non-space industries that is happening. And I think that very honestly, um, the, the successful startups, space startups, today are going to be the successful um, space businesses of tomorrow and maybe simply businesses because when you talk to, to a number of space companies, for instance, that are performing microgravity experiments, they see themselves as biology companies and not as space companies. Yeah, you're, right. you're actually describing much more uh, companies that are the simply high-tech companies. Um, and maybe this, the, the segment to describe that this is space only or new space investment and you don't go beyond is maybe a little bit uh, too simple and, and naive. Things are more complex and we basically talk about high-tech startups. So, um, Pierre, what do you think you see? Yeah, absolutely. Chatted? I think it's, it's very much core to our investment mandates. Um, we uh, see and we look at space as a piece of infrastructure that's enab enabling a lot of things, you know, in space, obviously, but also back on Earth. Um, so you look at the GPS, for example, you know, it enables about 14 to 18% of global GDP. Uh, it's an absolutely seminal technology that's, you know, probably one of the most important technologies um, that emerged over the last 50, 60 years. Um, so space um, goes way beyond space and back on Earth, I think there are a lot of applications and we are particularly interested in that application layer. I think it's also important, uh, you know, for us as uh, trying to make uh, this sector uh, more, um, more accessible uh, with the wider public and wider audience. Um, I think, you know, I very much see our job as also um, uh, mainstreaming this um, this industry uh, and making sure you know the public understands you know the relevance and the importance of space uh, as an industry and as a theme you know going forward. How much? Uh, how important is actually public funding? If you you know take the private funding, public funding. We were mentioning PPPs in another sense. I know, but now I'm talking about this. Um, public-private partnerships, how important is it for you as an investor to look at a company and know that it has a pillar or a program uh, supported by 
pub public uh, uh, by an institution uh, like a space agency or by a government or the, or the commission. Is that a criteria for you? Does that reassure you? Are you expecting this? And where will it go? Lynn, uh, oh, no, well, <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> um, well, I think that it is reassuring to see that in Europe, on both the institutional, but then also on the national level, there is more funding. Um, I think that's partly related to the fact that um, it's closer. People realize that space has a positive impact on citizens, on people. Um, it's also the realization that space is too much of an important topic to just outsource it to the US. Um, which I think is very important. Um, the way I see it is that what's very much needed on uh, on the public engagement side is, um, you know, that the, the governments and the agencies position as customers. Um, I think that's very key for the companies. Um, I think as well that um, you have really good examples. When I take ESA as an example, you would, for instance, have a clear space where ESA clearly gave a contract for an entire space debris removal mission. Um, you have uh, the example of Claudio, um, the geospatial data platform, where basically ESA put Claudio there as a kind of a broker, uh, as their data broker. And I think it just depends on, the cre on a little bit of creativity to strike these types of contracts. But I think that's very much needed. What we look at when we look at companies is that they strike the right balance between public and commercial contracts. Because I think that what really provides the hockey stick effect in revenues in companies are the commercial contracts. Yeah. 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 So, so my short answer is it depends. Uh, some companies uh, have, you know, commercially ready products going after private uh, customers in a variety of industries or verticals, um, and they absolutely do not need uh, public support uh, in their go-to market. And so, for those, uh, you know, public support is you know could be beneficial but at the end of the day they don't they don't need it uh, other companies which are uh, going after use cases applications and markets which are you know further away in time um, and are really engaged into you know some heavy r d um, and engineering uh, will need uh, support from those public institutions, uh, oftentimes as you know, kind of the first reference customer, and, and that is absolutely critical. You know, the U.S. does it in a certain way. Uh, other countries also do it in a certain way. I think in Europe we have our own way of doing it, um, and that's definitely beneficial for those companies. And usually, these are the companies which are, you know, embarking themselves on you know those more out there, you know, moonshot uh, endeavors, which are, you know, today may not seem um, relevant, uh, but will be absolutely critical in the future. Yeah, it's certainly right that um, um, public institutions, governments, uh, European Commission or people like that, space agencies also are no longer only on the top level investing into uh, space ventures and you put private money into it. They are more and more also showing up on the customer commercial level as potential customers of these constellations, which is a kind of different support, which is what I think ESA means when ESA says, for example, we go for commercialization. It means we can become customer of constellations. Sometimes we have the impression um, that investors find that small is beautiful. Uh, micro launchers, nano satellites, and uh, all this goes uh, versus uh, the big incumbents. Is it a cr criteria for you? Is there something in in, in Nutsa that you know can generate out of a very small startup, a company like, like SpaceX? Some are hoping for uh, is small beautiful. Um, well, I think you got to start small. So, you know, that's usually your starting point. Um, having the entrepreneurial agility of a small organization to move fast um, and potentially disrupt something or address a market that hasn't been disrupted in a very long time or ever is, you know, really what we're looking for in, in those companies. So I guess in that sense, yes, small is beautiful. But then, you know, in order to... 
you know, become a relevant organization, you got to become bigger and bigger. Uh, and so then you start getting into those, you know, typical uh, issues with uh, which are associated to to scaling a business. Yeah, Lynn, anything to add? Um, well, w when you refer to micro launches specifically, I think that uh, with the introduction of space tugs, with SpaceX's uh, what are they called, transporter missions, um, and also with uh, the the wide availability of cheap flights. Um, I think that the, the 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 real advantages of micro launchers are kind of er being eroded. Um, I think what makes sense is something in between a micro launcher and a bigger rocket, where it's um, let's say big enough to be cheap, but um, that it still offers this advantage of taking the customer to the place they want to go, uh, pretty much um, uh, with the schedule that's on demand. Um, so I think that something in between uh, might make sense. Um, I do see market for these types of launchers, um, especially when you look at the the the, the rise of, of smaller satellites, of new space constellations, of sensors for environmental monitoring, for instance. Um, so I do see that market. Obviously, it's not going to be a huge market with hundreds of stakeholders. So it will be five to 10 companies maximum that will win the, win the game. Um, and here, um, obviously, the, the, the key factor is always cost. Um, and, and when you talk about cost, you talk about reusability. So I think that the, the, the company that will win the race is going to be the one that will have reusable uh, small rockets. Um, and, and there, we as a fund, or let's say the partners of our fund, they bet on ESA Aerospace because they are exactly in that category where it's um, large enough to be cheap, um, but it offers all the other advantages. Yeah, Jean-Jacques, Jean uh, we have still two minutes uh, to go or, uh, okay, then I would just like to, you know, take your last answer and tr uh, try to wrap this up. You were starting to talk about the criteria you are putting actually in your investment. What is crucial? Which box does a company have to tick in order that you put money into it? What is um, uh, what is the crucial three things? And these are then the key success factors we wanted to talk about for you to judge on an investment to do. Yeah. So, you know, at the early stage, it's a bit like real estate where it's all about location. Uh, in our case, it's all about the entrepreneur. You know, we are in the business of backing people uh, at the early stage. Um, and so we'll, you know, it's going to be 85, 90% the entrepreneur and what this entrepreneur is, is looking to do, uh, you know, their vision and their ability to execute on that vision. Obviously, you have secondary matters, which are, you know, kind of market size and technology. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about the type of people we're backing. Okay. To make it very short to me, it's uh, the team market disruption potential and uh, entry barriers. Um, so first of all, on the team, when you when you invest at very early stage, you have nothing but a team. So you need to have a CEO that is driven, that has a vision and not just a dream. Um, that person needs to be this um, kind of hybrid person that's very knowledgeable about the technology, but with a sense for commercial uh, commercialization. Um, and you need honest and transparent people because when I have the feeling that someone is kind of artificially inflating their revenues, um, the, the number of investors they have, that doesn't build trust. Um, and then obviously you look at whether it is feasible to develop a technology in a given time, uh, time frame um, and what a disruptive uh, character of the technology is. Um, and then last but not least, you look at the market, the market uh, growth rate, um, the company's in and how the company actually um, approaches the market, how it intends to lead it, because that's what we all want. We want companies that lead a market. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, um, being so efficient also in your answers, Jean-Jacques, we gained you some time for your program. Thank you. So, thank thank you. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. I think that uh, we, uh, I really appreciate that you could, uh, you could reduce your, your time. Uh, maybe I take the opportunity for one remark uh, because you, you said that small is beautiful. Uh, I would like to, to say that for me, it's much more cheap is beautiful. So uh, this is not the size uh, of the uh, 
product which is important, but the size of the investment. So it's uh, uh, just to, to uh, quote for the hundreds of time, Jeff Bezos. Uh, don't, don't forget that Jeff Bezos said that he has always been interested in space but that to invest in space, he had first to become rich. And this is the reason why he has created Amazon. And that is uh, certainly something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the, the, the level of investment is still, uh, unfortunately, uh, too high. Okay, so thank you very much. I think that uh, we shall have other opportunities to come back to, to that. Uh, now, uh, this is the last uh, session of the, uh, of the morning which is a, a special announcement uh, and uh, a briefing for not only you, but also for the press. So this is the launch. I think that uh, it's good to launch something. Uh, this is the launch of uh, uh, YES. So you, you, maybe you wonder what means YES. It's a young European enterprise for space syndicate that it's, uh, I would have preferred myself Soviet, but okay, that uh, uh, let's keep syndicate. Um, uh, and uh, I would like to call for, uh, this is an initiative by six European enterprise. Uh, three of them are on site, and I would like to call uh, Nicolas uh, Capet from uh, Any Waves, uh, David Henry from Exotrel and Benoît Deper from Aerospace Lab to uh, come on stage. And, uh, and we have uh, the three other entrepreneurs uh, who are supposed to be online, at least I hope that they are online, which is Juan Hernani from Satlantis. Uh, okay, I, uh, Juan, are you there? Yes, good morning, Jean-Jacques. Ah, uh, good morning, just Juan. In time. Uh, we have Adria Ajemi from Pangea. Adria? No, it's, it's Xavier representing Pangea. Ah, okay. Uh, yes. okay, but this Hello. is the same. Uh, and uh, uh, Max, Max Gulder from Constel R. Are you there? No, but okay. The, he should be, he should be there, but at least this is the six founding members of uh, this uh, uh, new uh, uh, grouping. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, I shall take the opportunity uh, to have in the room uh, Geraldine Naja, who is the uh, uh, acting director for commercialization, industry, and procurement. And I must say that this is a good opportunity uh, to have her in the room to uh, uh, to appreciate or not uh, the fact that uh, the young enterprise are trying to do more collectively. So I give the floor to uh, Nicolas Capet, who is uh, on site and who is the vice president of that uh, syndicate. Uh, after that, I shall give the floor to each of the ones on site and then each of the ones uh, online. You have each maximum, maximum five minutes to say, number one, who you are and what is your enterprise, and number two, why you have taken that, what I consider important initiative. So, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean-Jacques, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Nicolas Capé, CEO of Any Waves, and what we do is that we design, manufacture, and commercialize uh, antennas, especially for the satellite constellation market. Very briefly, today, Any Waves, uh, it's about 21 people, more than uh, 90 flight models delivered in less than uh, four years, and uh, many future uh, projects uh, I hope uh, we, we will have. Today, I'm very pleased to announce uh, this initiative, yes, with all my friends, because I think we are living a, a critical period for, for space because it's a revolution. Revolution, we saw that uh, from, uh, from the US, but also now uh, in Europe. Why we decided uh, to create this syndicate 
is because we have shared a, a lot of things uh, together, even if we have developed on our side, on our technology, uh, bringing uh, very interesting innovation to the space market and more specifically to the new space market. And what we saw is that we are extremely good uh, for innovation to develop new products. But now we are in a time we need to go further and we need to deliver. It's time to deliver, it's time to make missions, it's time to provide data. And what we saw is that we are, I don't know, but some kind of weird companies uh, because we are not uh, doing the same way as traditional space companies for many reasons, uh, because we started from nothing, because the market we are addressing is quite different, because also the value proposition we are bringing is different, and we have to know each other more better uh, to go to this phase to deliver and propose real solution in order to make the European new space an extremely competitive uh, uh, industry in the future years. So definitely with YES, uh, it's some kind of responsibility uh, we have uh, all together because we have been supported from our very beginning by the institutions uh, at European level, at national level also. And now it is time to work together uh, more efficiently, uh, to know each other more efficiently. And our objective with this syndicate, uh, and we are going to invite uh, a lot of other uh, companies in the, the coming weeks, is to produce some elements explaining what we can propose, what we can do, and work together to find ways to do that. So I'm going to let uh, the microphone to uh, the next uh, speaker, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicolas. So I'm, I'm David. Uh, I'm co-founder of Exotrail. Um, and Exotrail is a space company, a space mobility company. Our job is to, as it was said in the panel earlier, uh, deliver things at the right place, at the right time, at the right cost. Um, so we are developing propulsion systems, uh, mission design and operation software, and space transportation vehicles for space. Uh, we uh, are about 50 people uh, in Paris and Toulouse in France. Uh, we've raised a bit more than 20 million euros to date. Uh, and we have customers uh, in Europe, in Asia, and uh, in the US, uh, including so institutional customers, uh, ISA, for instance, or the CNES Space Agency, uh, or the French Defense Agency, but also uh, commercial international customers, uh, such as uh, Clyde Space, Utilsat, uh, Thales. Uh, and, and from uh, York Space Systems, for instance, in the in the US for a moon mission we, we've just announced uh, last week. Um, so we are um, basically uh, we founded this syndicate uh, first because we, we we knew each other quite well and we wanted to to shape things a bit uh, in the sense that uh, we we all believe that um, the um, uh, European space industry uh, had been uh, had been used to uh, to let's say uh, trust uh, only big prime companies uh, for operational contracts, uh, and in the in the last five years, with the help of uh, such institutions, so such as uh, ISA uh, or national uh, institutions, uh, we we've proven that we can, as Nicolas was saying, um, build and deliver uh, actual operational products. Uh, that are flight proven. We are all in space around the table, so we have um, several uh, products uh, in space. Uh, and so that we are ready not to be considered as uh, startups anymore, but, but as just companies able to deliver um, operational concrete products and services uh, to commercial customers. We do that already, uh, but also to institutional customers um, and, um, and potentially directly with them. Uh, so not through a, a, a prime. It can be with a prime. We we worked and we we will work with with primes as well. But that's basically what we want to bring forward. Is uh, you've helped us uh, now. Uh, let us help you with our innovative solutions. Thank you. I will give the Thank microphone to, uh, to Benoit, a good friend Benoit. 
Thank you, David. Um, so a lot have been done and said by my two colleagues here, but uh, so I'm Benoit, founder of Aerospace Lab. We were founded three and a half years ago, and uh, now we are a bit more than 85 employees. We raised a fair bit of money in the capital, uh, mar venture capital market also with uh, debt instruments. And basically, we flown our first satellite uh, end of June on the SpaceX Transporter 2 mission, and it's working well. So uh, it was a huge relief. Um, to build upon what has been said before, uh, I believe that there is a, a, a slot missing in the wide range of organizations that are dealing with space syndicates in Europe. It's um, really one, and this is one of the main missions of YES today, is to make the market more efficient. By more efficient, I mean um, bring down the barriers. R&D grants and um, incubation schemes and so on are, are, are good to start up, as David said. But then we need to move on into uh, being trusted and being able to provide product and services that customers can rely upon with procurement contracts and not R&D contracts. So um, I guess I will stay there, uh, keeping the time frame in line. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, Juan. Juan. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So Juan is the, the CEO of Satlantis in uh, Spain. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. Hello, colleagues. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot join you in, uh, in person this morning, but nevertheless, a good opportunity from the technology to provide the message and be digitally with you. Satlantis is, uh, is an SME of uh, 55 employees uh, who has five, uh, five uh, space missions in Earth observation, uh, working with JAXA, NASA, and ESA. And we, we, are, we are very specialized with concentrating in space cameras for small satellites. And we ally with a number of uh, uh, partners in the ecosystem to provide full customer solutions, which is the, the main driver. I think our joining of, uh, of JES is, is, uh, and is very welcome because we believe that Europe uh, is, is pushing towards SMEs. So that Europe has published the EU industrial strategy for SMEs in, in March last year. We have the COSME program. Um, uh, we know that uh, two, two out of three employments in, in, the, in, the, in, in, uh, in the economy come from the, from the SMEs. But I think if we put focus into space, we realize that, uh, that uh, the leverage uh, the, that we require uh, from this potential is still to happen. So I think that, the, I mean, the joining forces uh, to tell uh, that we can grow, that we can create employment for, for the economy, that we can provide opportunities to the young engineers. And, uh, and we are very much adapted to the capacity of, uh, of the economy of Europe. So Europe and the US are similar GDP sizes, but Europe invests only one fourth of the, of the US investments. Therefore, we have to be more efficient we have to select the global niches better than our colleagues. We have to ally with the world, but uh, but I think a way to really be efficient in these investments is is to taking into account more the young uh, SMEs into space, and that is why GS has been born to make things easy for the institutions, for the companies. We are a very inclusive syndicate that welcomes. Uh, the profile of companies that is working with us. We have competitors inside. That's something we understand. It has to be like that. And uh, this is a channel of dialogue, continuous dialogue to the institutions to understand that the potential of, uh, of growth and mainly of employment is there. We have to align employment potential with, uh, with contracts, which is basically with the GDP that is devoted to the SMEs. And we have to do the job in the next few years. Okay, thank you, uh, Juan. So, Pangea, your turn. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud okay, and clear. So, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here digitally. So, my name is Charlie Dairo. I'm uh, the CCO and one of the co founders of Pangea Aerospace. And uh, at Pangea Aerospace, we are building uh, micro launchers, but focusing mostly on the disruptive technology needed to bring down the cost of, of launch. Currently, we are focusing on developing an aerospike engine, which is an engine that is uh, way more efficient than currently used bell nozzle, but that had uh, some engineering complexities in the past that we are on the way of, of solving thanks to additive manufacturing, 
to new materials such as uh, new copper alloys, and uh, we are doing things differently. So uh, this is one of the main reasons we joined YES, because uh, we believe that it's uh, fundamental uh, for institutions to trust these companies that are doing things faster, uh, cheaper, and uh, probably can uh, can achieve a, a really good end result as well um, and be competitive with, with big primes. So we are uh, extremely happy. I will not uh, take long because most of the of the main elements for YES Syndicate have been already said by my by my colleagues, but uh, I will uh, restate one of the major elements. I think it's fundamental to have it clear that yes, it's an open syndicate. We will uh, make it grow in the in the following weeks with uh, young companies, young European companies from the from the space sector. So everybody is invited to to contact us, to join us, to to make this uh, syndicate grow, and uh, to have an open channel with uh, with uh, European institutions in the next uh, years. Thank you very much, okay. everybody. Thank you. So, Max, are you online? No, I don't think so. So, uh, le let's let's continue. And uh, so, the the six founding member is uh, Max Gulder from Constell R uh, from Germany, and uh, so meaning that uh, for the time being, in the founding member, we have. Uh, Two, uh, two Spanish, uh, two uh, French, one Belgium and uh, one uh, German. So it's not yet Europe, but uh, I am sure that this will grow. If I can make a story short with what you said, what you say is we are good alone, but we can do much better together. This is the way I, uh, I take your, uh, your point. And, uh, uh, and I think that that's good. I, I would like just to make one remark is that yes, they will cooperate on mutual interest, but they are ready to compete if they have different interests. So this is a combination of cooperation when they have mutual interest, but competition when they have specific interests. So uh, uh, cooperation does not exclude competition, as I said uh, this morning. I like competition. So before taking questions, maybe since uh, we have uh, Geraldine Naja uh, in the room, uh, I, I would like to have your view on that since you are in charge of uh, industry and procurement and ESA is certainly uh, an important uh, potential customer. Thank you, Jean-Jacques, and uh, hello, everyone. I can only welcome this initiative because uh, it is our experience at ESA to work with industry, and we have, as you know, um, associations of industry, be it uh, Eurospace, uh, AED, we have also SME for Space, and now we have YES. And I think it's a very good step forward because we are at ESA trying to and with the advent of this new commercialization set up at ESA, we are trying to work better and more with the new space world. It is clear if we want to stay in the race, if we want to stay relevant, we have to work with you. And you have lots to tell us and to teach us. And we really want your feedback on how best we can help you, how best we can support you, not just because we like you, but because you are a, a, a very important source of innovation and competitiveness for the European space sector. So I welcome the fact that now I have an interlocutor with a, a European space startups. I will call on you. You can count on me. <laughs> and I will wait for your inputs to our initiative in commercialization. Uh, already I have talked to some of you and I know I have uh, lots to take from you. So welcome, congratulations uh, for this superb initiative and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you Geraldine. I think that uh, since I was your professor, you, you know that mutual interest is, al is always more sustainable than love. That it's, uh, this is uh, the, uh, what, I can, what I can repeat. So now, I think that uh, we, uh, we would like to take questions. First of all, do we have questions uh, in, in the room? No, you are all waiting for lunch, but we have questions. We have questions online. So, uh, Charlotte. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. Uh, so we are valuable members of the press that are following the, the announcement right now remotely. 
Um, I don't know if I can uh, mention the press uh, in particular. I will tell you right after this. But the question is, if I, I, if I have correctly understood, yes, will be an industry organization that will interface with the European Commission to get the Commission to take SMEs new space into account when making procurement decisions. It's more difficult to see what yes do with respect to prospective commercial customers. Is that it? So, who is taking that? Nicolas? Yes. Um, yeah, definitely, uh, but it's based on our experience, uh, especially even with customers, uh, pure uh, private customers. Uh, we are going faster than they are used to. Uh, we are able to take more risk and responsibility on what we deliver, uh, and they are not used to that. Uh, we deliver on time. Uh, there is a lot of things that are quite different and disturbing both uh, from, I would say, traditional uh, space big players uh, and also with our institutions because we are yeah, a new kind of companies uh, with our way uh, to develop, make the industry uh, digitalization, we are a new generation, so we, we have some different ways to, uh, to, to do things. Uh, and now we are capable to deliver uh, extremely good equipments to make Europe competitive. Just to give an example, uh, we luckily had a, a major success uh, last year because we have been selected by uh, Airbus Defense and Space to deliver uh, S-band antennas for their Constellation co 3 d uh, This was the first time such a big prime was working uh, with a very young company like us. And we had to demonstrate very intensively, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to demonstrate them that we are capable to deliver with a high level of quality, uh, with their expectations, and being, uh, uh, I would say, completely autonomous in order to produce and deliver all these uh, equipments. So what we want to do is to make our partners, institutions, but also uh, big, uh, big companies, big traditional space companies, uh, we, uh, the way we, we, we can deliver and, uh, and being involved uh, in our future challenges, uh, especially at the benefit at the end of the competitiveness in Europe and also for our citizens, because we are all bringing extremely interesting uh, solutions, space solutions, uh, to our citizens. Okay, so th thank you, uh, Nicola. Maybe Juan, you have also commercial customers. You you are not selling only to institutions, so maybe you can you you can make uh, also some remarks there. And any other one of you, if you if you wish to add, but th there are other questions coming. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. I think um, I think the question is is very relevant. So this is not a lobby uh, towards the institutions. I think this is a, an awareness exercise to realize uh, the value of a sector or a subsector in Europe. And certainly, there is one line of uh, institutional customers. We want them to be customers, uh, and that is one of the lines. But certainly, the rest of the lines, either the B two B. Lines that Nicola was mentioning that it would be relationships between space companies, but also I think there is a strong pending subject of bringing space into the economies in general. So um, I think we have a role to 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 connect to oil and gas companies like uh, one of our shareholders, Enagas, who has a problem uh, and that is uh, uh, methane emissions, and they want they want to solve. Uh, they want to know how many emissions they are, they are having and where they are and so on. So space is a fantastic tool to arrive to that. And of course, agriculture is a, is a, I mean, a very traditional sector that is demanding space services. But I think this in line of uh, connecting to customer problems and putting the customer in the center through services. Normally, it's a, it's a, the, the natural connection uh, for customers to demand uh, space. And I think we have a lot to bring uh, as, uh, as, uh, as young SMEs 
uh, into the problem. So yes, I think we also consider uh, the activity of connecting to clients. Okay, so I propose to take the next question and after the others, you could even come back to, to that question, but I prefer to get the next question from Charlotte. That will be the last question. So you are six founding members. Is there an opportunity for another company to join the founding members right now? Uh, is there any specific criteria? Yes, so indeed, uh, there are specific criteria because uh, it mainly involves uh, uh, European companies and young European uh, companies. Uh, today, uh, the basis is to, to be uh, 10 years old, uh, I would say, at, uh, at maximum. Uh, but definitely, in the coming weeks, uh, you can contact us, and we are also going to invite a lot of other uh, companies uh, in Europe to join this uh, initiative initiative, especially if you are facing uh, the, 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 same, uh, uh, the same ambition for Europe, uh, I think it's, it's always time to spend, uh, to propose and to work and to make proposal uh, with all our partners, but it's part of our responsibility also as European companies to be able to propose concrete things, uh, to work together and face all other uh, competitors uh, worldwide because as it was mentioned we are very fine with competition we are competitors from our very beginning from the first day we decided to create our companies we want to compete every day but the worst thing for a competitor is not being able to participate to a competition okay thank you uh, any other uh Remark, maybe uh, Benoit. I was just going to add that um, if you feel that you are you are maybe a competitor to one of the six companies, feel free to apply. And as Nicolas was saying, uh, it's one of the main goal of the of the Yes Syndicate is to really um, have a speaking place uh, for companies that may be doing the same thing and bidding against each other. And we are there to make the market more efficient and really to push competition forward. Okay. Just let me give you a small detail, uh, and that is by law. Uh, uh, there is for during the first year, the, found, the, the members that uh, join the association are considered founding members. So okay. uh, that that would be a statutory position. Okay, you, maybe you could you could publish uh, your uh, your charter because uh, I think that uh, this is also the best way to uh, to to show to potential uh, candidates. Uh, where they are embarking uh, on. So it's, uh, and uh, speaking of young, when the young become old, they can become alumni that uh, you will, uh, you will measure the success by the size of your alumni. So it's, uh, we shall see that. Uh, so do we have another question, Charlotte? Um, so another member of the press. From how many companies do you think to be enough to get a better access to the market? So uh, I, I think that um, uh, there is no, uh, let's say, uh, f fixed number uh, after which uh, you can be heard. Uh, and what Geraldine said is already says that uh, uh, already the energy that we brought the six of us uh, uh, is, is, uh, can be enough to spark discussions uh, with the institutions. I think we've already uh, proven that uh, we can be successful uh, on the commercial side as well, um, uh, on our own. So what, again, what the, the reason why we, 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 we created that initiative is, is not so much to be helped, but really to help the institutions. Um, and, and so that's why um, I think that uh, everyone that uh, uh, wants to do the same is welcome to join, uh, to join us. Uh, and, and it's true that the more, uh, the, 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 more the, the, the better in the sense that uh, we will have more, uh, let's say, um, uh, interest from the uh, institutions. But uh, we, we judge that uh, having uh, you know, our companies uh, in, in, in four countries uh, and it has been proven by, by the early contacts we, we, we have uh, at ESA and, 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 and the Commission uh, is enough to spark a uh, movement and then to accelerate it. We, we are welcoming new, uh, new, new members as well. 
Okay, so Xavier, yes, you have a remark. Absolutely. Maybe if I if I can add a little bit, so we would like to be a representative of all uh, different European countries. It is an ambitious goal, but uh, it would be it would be great uh, to have uh, members from all across Europe and also all across the value chain in space. And last but not least, again, I will repeat what Benoit said, but uh, all competitors uh, are. Uh, We'll be happy to have uh, competitors within the YES syndicate because we believe that uh, together we can be stronger um, in front of uh, European institutions. Wait, David. Just one quick thing to add is uh, one of the, the strengths that we had also is to be efficient. Uh, so that's why, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, the fact that we are all young um, in, in terms of uh, when we created the company, we knew each other quite well. Uh, space is also, as you know, a, a small community where people uh, know and, and like each other quite well. And so that helped a lot to be efficient, to create that initiative. And that sense of efficiency and agility is something that we really want to, uh, to keep uh, in the future of the, of the syndicate, uh, which is very important because if the syndicate promotes efficiency, uh, it needs to be efficient itself. So, um, so yeah, just to add that. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, and you can you can believe me since I am very old. Uh, uh, to be young is a sickness that unfortunately you recover much too quickly. Uh, you uh, yes, there is a question in the room. Yes, il y a un micro là. Oui. I have a question. So very exciting uh, uh, initiative, and I think that uh, um, to rally all your forces. I have a specific question. I look, it's very disruptive from the technology side and commercial side, uh, how do you include also the downstream and also so data analysis, uh, uh, so revenue that you, will, you can do as, uh, as a data companies, like Planet started as a, as a laboratory, but now they are a data company. And my second question, how do you connect with the effort from academia uh, to bring you actually some of the workforce that could uh, populate uh, some of your uh, work? So do you have some link with some universities or, or uh, academia uh, to work together? I can maybe start with the data part and downstream part because we are partially involved in this. I would say that 30% of our uh, workforce is dedicated to data processing. So I don't believe there is something um, strictly against having downstream company involved in, in this syndicate, even though uh, they have to match uh, the criteria uh, to be uh, published by Nicola later on, but uh, I don't see any issue. And on the academic side, um, I'm not sure I'm the one qualified to answer this, but uh, since we are <laughs> focusing into selling products and, and, and services, um, I, I, it's really blurry to me where is the, the boundary between academia and, and private. I know that from the data side, for us, okay, I'm involved in the AI department of uh, Amsterdam. So we have 200 students per year now. And so they are eager to contribute to some of this initiative. We try to incorporate uh, space data analysis, for instance, and so they could bring very new concept also to your disruptive hardware technology. So it's, it's something that I can add a bit, uh, one example on academia, uh, uh, which is even, even though we were a startup uh, and uh, we were young, uh, we, so one of our products <coughs> is called ExoOps and is a mission design and operation software. And a few months back, we uh, created the ExoOps for university program, uh, where a partnered university can access uh, the software for free so that they can learn how to uh, build a space mission, uh, how flight dynamics works, uh, and so on. Um, and I think that's the kind of initiative that we want to promote as well uh, as part of the syndicate, um, because uh, we think that, as it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Pascal, uh, STEM is very important, and, and we need to, uh, to, to, let's say, build uh, the, the, the next decades of, of, of the space industry. And it's the people who are studying now that will be, we hope, at our seats in, in, in five or ten years. Okay, thank you. Let's talk. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the most difficult part of our lives is just time. Uh, and I see that I am again in the red. Uh, so, I would like maybe to ask uh, Juan to, uh, to make a short conclusion and uh, take up uh, other aspects if you wish. But just to say that this is just the starting point. Uh, we uh, and 
you will get all the uh, address of all these guys uh, to if you wish to uh, uh, enter the, the the syndicate if you wish to raise questions to them and so on they are there for that so Juan you uh, you give the final words thank you very much uh, Jean Jacques um, so on, on behalf of my colleagues um, I want to thank uh, this opportunity that we had today to to, to give the first voice in public to the GS uh, initiative. The first message is to the SMEs in space in Europe. So please write to any of us and we will channel your, uh, your participation to be uh, an active member very soon. So we want to be a group of 50 uh, pretty soon uh, in this, this objective of the, of the foundation. And uh, it, it's not a matter of size, so it's a matter of efficiency uh, as David was saying, and, and, and quality, but of course we want to have this strong representation of, uh, of the whole activity. The second message uh, comes to the institutions, to the European Commission and ESA, that you know that we are here at your disposal, uh, that is a positive um, birth to, to align uh, the European strategies in, in SMEs, in industrials, uh, in industrial sectors, also in space to make things life easy from both sides. No? We have to finally increase uh, this, this uh, activity of SMEs that today is a, is a humble digit in the total, uh, according to, this, to the amounts that you published. And normally it is a subcontract activity in the, in the total. So, so that has to be a step-by-step step, uh, a higher uh, activity that will protect uh, the employment in Europe. So the gap we have today between what we represent in terms of uh, potential or real employment for the youth and uh, the, the, uh, the turnover of the companies is something that cannot last very long because if it stays there for, for a few years, there will be uh, companies that will get out of the scene. And we don't want that. We want everyone who has talent and, and energy to be inside the group. So this is our role to, to, to really um, uh, provide this added value to the European development, uh, have this special focus in the employment. So we are going to provide data and transparency on, on, on this element for the awareness of the opportunity. This is not a lobby to fight uh, for, for the agendas of a number of uh, companies. This is a connection to what Europe has to be uh, in the European space. So I think with these uh, two messages, and of course, we will go with further messages to universities, research associations, centers, et cetera, that we have uh, encompassed in our statutory act. So we call them associate members, but that will come a little bit later. I think we first have to be, have to put the bones uh, of, the, of the activity and, uh, and just uh, for you to realize that we are there and we are bringing value to the space uh, European development. Okay, so thank you very much. I, sh I shall have to, uh, to close uh, this session and uh, by quoting again a minister from Luxembourg, we have started with a minister and I would like to finish by another minister who, uh, who is the minister of finance of Luxembourg who said, and this is fantastic for a minister of science, finance to say that, that the richest bank today are not anymore the bank of money, but the bank of data. And that is uh, certainly something that uh, we have to keep in mind. So thank you very much. We are already six minutes uh, after takeoff. So uh, we are already above the atmosphere. So uh, have a good lunch. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.